Oh, cool, that worked. Hi. Hi, everybody. Wake up. Uh, I'm Nick. Uh, hey, those are my slides, too. Uh, I'm QRush on Twitter, and I'm going to talk about OpenHack. Uh, I really love programming. Programming is like my favorite thing to do ever. And uh, I'm like this kid when I'm programming, and I'm banging my hammer, and all of a sudden there's stuff that's just flying out of my machine. Out of, come on, do it, kid. <laughs> so like, this is what I, I really I love. I love programming. And one of the things that I found out uh, when I lived in Boston was that there's a simple formula that pizza plus beer equals code. So if you provide food and you have drinks, for some reason that's very productive. Uh, we used to have Boston RB Hackfests uh, that we would do. This formula worked, and this is how RubyGems.org started and a bunch of other stuff. And uh, I wanted a way to do this Hackfest thing over and over again. Uh, I moved, recently moved to Buffalo, New York. And I wanted a way to have that same kind of feel that well, I didn't really have in a, in a smaller city. And I basically wrote down a bunch of rules for doing hack fests, and it's called Open Hack. And I'm going to tell you what it is. Uh, so how does it work? Uh, it's <laughs> I, have a lot, I also like GIFs. Uh, anyway. <laughs> Uh, so first of all, someone must organize it. Uh, someone, this is me in Buffalo. Uh, one, one person, hopefully it doesn't loop. OK, good. Uh, uh, so one person puts it together, and they're kind of the point of contact. Uh, let's keep going. Uh, the organizer leads intros. And this is super important. And they're not awkward, I promise. Uh, the intros are important because this is going to keep going. OK. You got to put, not dolphins here. OK. So the intros are important because I'm going to go to the next point. <laughs> OK. <laughs> I should have put a pause button on this. All right. All right, so you want to say who and what you are in the intros. You want to do them every night, because that brings new people into the groups. And that keeps, pe like, if you've ever gone into a room and there's a bunch of nerds coding, and you don't know what to do, and you don't want to say hi, because you might interrupt, you just want to do an intro. 7 p.m., for example, in Buffalo, we say who you are, what you're going to work on. Uh, working alone is OK. This guy's playing baseball in space by himself. OK? <laughs> OK? <laughs> All right? Working alone is OK. Uh, you can ask for help. That's OK, too. If you have an open source thing, or you just want help with the work problem, or you just want to get some work done, that's cool. Uh, you can pair on something. These two are hacking the network, and they're typing on the same keyboard. And <laughs> so this pairing on something is fine. Uh, you could just talk and drink, too, because that's OK. So like, <laughs> you need to do this. <laughs> OK, so usually we wrap up after two hours. Other groups have been trying longer. Uh, I get sleepy. I want to go home and see my dog. Uh, sponsors help a lot, too. Uh, we have 37 Signals and Engine Yard have been helping out with the Buffalo group. Uh, finding people that can just, it's like, it's like you get less than 100 bucks to pay for pizza and maybe some beer. So just doing that helps. And then you don't have to worry, oh, do I have to go home and get food or whatnot? Uh, so we run this every two to three weeks in Buffalo. Uh, <laughs> This is a thing. It's really good. Uh, uh, I found out there's a, there's a bunch locally. Uh, ben, Boise, uh, Logan. Where I don't know where Logan is. Sounds cool. Uh, Tulsa, Albuquerque, San Francisco, Santa Barbara, and maybe your city. These are just the ones that are locally. We're in 60 plus cities. I want to get to 100 by the end of the year. So if you're interested in organizing uh, one, that'd be awesome. Uh, there's also plenty in the, on the East Coast. There's plenty in Europe already and some in Asia. It's mind blowing. All I did was write down about all those rules except the funny gifts. Uh, so if, you, if you're interested, uh, you now go to openhack.github.io. Uh, I also have announcements, some announcements for groups on Twitter. And that's all I got. Okay, I kid. I was lying. I have. T I have. Oh, okay. I had 20 seconds. I'm going to use those. Uh, I'm throwing a Ruby conference uh, with a bunch of other people from the Western New York uh, Ruby group uh, in Buffalo, New York, in, on September 20th and 21st. Uh, come to come to Buffalo. We're going to talk about Ruby. That's at NickelCityRuby.com. Thank you. All right. I'm a professional. I can wait to my. Yeah. There's uh, 42 speakers. <laughs> And uh, only six bowls of water, so. Um. <laughs> anyway, so. Um, 
uh, I'm a big fan of, of what Heroku built. And uh, unfortunately, as I tell this story, uh, I'm a bit of a sad panda. We can't use that. So uh, I became really interested in, uh, in Cloud Foundry. So um, I, uh, I now work at a company, uh, created a company called Stark and Wayne, which uh, I am unreliably informed is the first and only company with, with two fictional founders. Um, so board meetings are exciting since I'm talking to myself. And, uh, um, but the good news is uh, I won't be alone. Uh, they won't be alone you know, soon. Uh, I'll be getting my fancy O-1 visa. And uh, for you Americans who perhaps don't need visas, since you're American, if you're not following along, um, the O-1 visa is uh, the alien of extraordinary ability. <laughs> So, uh, so uh, fancy dress day will be pants on the un uh, underpants on the outside. It's gonna be awesome. So, uh, uh, one of the as a as a consultant, what we're working for is uh, what we're working for is a large uh, enterprise company, and they wanted to do agile. They wanted to do PaaS, whole awesome, really cool ideas what they're doing. Um, because if <laughs> I feel really bad for all the people who've ever tried to do agile, but haven't had. Paz. <laughs> I'd like to know how many careers have been destroyed by, yes, we should do Agile. Great. Uh, we'll deploy that in three weeks. Um, so uh, unfortunately, as a, we, we have a very hard rule around uh, we want everything in our uh, internal private clouds across, you know, around the world. Um, but that breaks my cardinal rule of everyone deserves nice things. Um, just because we work at a company that has cubicles doesn't mean uh, we don't, I don't use a cubicle, that's a terrible idea, but they do exist, you, you know, there are other people in them. I don't know where they come from and where they go, but every day they turn up. Um, but we deserve nice things. We should be allowed to have a Heroku. I think that's, that's appropriate. And uh, so fortunately, there is one, it's called Cloud Foundry. And, uh, and the challenge is, is that Cloud Foundry is currently not necessarily the easiest thing to run yourself. Um, where we work, uh, we actually outsource it to a company called Tier 3, and they set up and script all our, you know, Cloud Foundry running, and I just think that's entirely inappropriate. What's the, I, I must admit, one of my pet peeves in the universe is companies that say, yes, here's our open source thing, and, you know, running it is left as a reader, you know, an exercise to the reader. Um, and uh, I think that's inappropriate, and uh, so, uh, it's been a pet project of mine to, uh, to sort of make running Cloud Foundry really, really easy. So, got it down to two commands and, uh, sorry, two tools and uh, six. It's now five commands. So that was very exciting. You weren't even watching, and it went down to five. Um, and those are uh, a tool called Bosch Bootstrap and Bosch Cloud Foundry. And I'm not going to even tell you what they are. I'm just going to show you the commands to run. Um, because I, I honestly don't think you need to know. You just want Cloud Foundry running because you want your own Heroku. Um, so these are the commands. You basically install a gem called Bosch Bootstrap. You run the next command. And if you're following along, you figure out you could run the command that comes after that one. Then you run the one that comes after that. And then you run all the other commands that I haven't mentioned. <laughs> and uh, they are relatively interactive. They're going to ask you some intelligent questions like, uh, I don't know, what's your Amazon credentials? That's a good one. Um, now, if you've ever used Fog, It'll actually go and find your credentials and suck them up and just use them. It'll ask you, or you might want to use OpenStack. Um, ultimately, it's going to ask you about DNS and all those sorts of things that's going to prompt you through. And the reason I built this was I had written documentation. And uh, I was tired of writing documentation, so I just wrote a tool that just made you do it yourself. You might wonder, what is this, what you get? What you get is some boxes. I don't, I don't know. They're square. If you've ever wondered what Amazon's boxes look like, they're squares. Um, so it's kind of cool. If you're able to run your, your own Cloud Foundry for 30 cents an hour, is pretty cool. Uh, you might want to run some services. You might want to run uh, DEAs, or like where the dynos run, so to speak. Um, and it does all of it in little commands to help you along. So it takes about three hours. So you can imagine we're not going to do a demo now. Thank you very much. Can I get a show of hands of people who hate show of hands at conferences? This talk is dedicated to you. All questions will be rhetorical. <laughs> you may have heard of technical debt. I'm here to talk to you about technical intimidation. Do you know Rails? Do you know all of Rails? Do you know why we like the word active so much, but not so much that we couldn't call it active mailer? <laughs> Can you program concurrently? Can you asynchronously stream hypermedia? 
I don't really know what that is, but Google Image gave me this, and Klavnik's up there, so legit. <laughs> Can you inject SQL into a cannoli? Do you know how to get closure with your monads? Again, uh, Google Image, I don't know, but I guess it has something to do with futility. <laughs> Does anyone understand what this is in JavaScript? Do you know they're actually putting JavaScript on servers these days? Which reminds me, I have a Kickstarter for hosting Oracle in my browser, so if you've got any loose change. <laughs> Does anybody know what Adam Keyes is talking about here? Do you know if you take out all the buzzwords from this post, all you're left with is ASCII art of a troll face? <laughs> all these were taken from recent Ruby and JavaScript weekly news editions. Does anyone here know all of this? If you said yes, you're lying, because I made that one up. <laughs> but seriously, recently a prominent member of our industry posted this on his blog, and he said, I was reluctant to ask a question. I wanted to be seen as savvy and on the ball. And if you can relate to that, I can relate to that. So can Kent Beck. But sometimes it's not just that, sometimes it's me and just technology and we're staring at each other and I just know it's just gonna be this big pain in the neck and it's just gonna leave me with this feeling of shame. Now there are two traits common to people. One is adaptability and the other is shame and when you combine these, you get hoarders. <laughs> now if you're laughing, while there is a bit of the ridiculous in that picture, it illustrates how powerful shame can be in our lives. And while it may not play out so noticeably for most of us, shame can shape our thoughts and feelings in similar ways, with these sorts of messages just kind of running around through our mind all day. Jerry Weinberg was once asked, what do you consider the most important thing for a programmer to do when beginning a new project? I think each should be sure they are in good physical condition without nagging psychological problems. <laughs> Now these shame messages are nagging psychological problems and since shame does have a way of robbing our perspective and convincing us we're stuck, let's put what we do back into perspective. Software is hard. Steve McConnell, uh, Steve McConnell par paraphrasing Dykstra says, computing is the only profession in which a single mind is obliged to span the intellectual distance of nine orders of magnitude. Eric Sink in his blog once detailed 46 levels of abstraction his .NET application has to deal with. Raymond Chen, a well-known blogger from inside Microsoft, once went through a detailed post about why it's a bad idea to delete a critical section while you're in that critical section, but after all of these reasons why not to do it, concludes with, but maybe there's a flaw in my logic. <laughs> Jan Mikskowski talks about good design being a fractally hard problem. The more closely you focus on any given feature, the more rough edges you find to polish, and the only sane approach is to iterate in an area until you've got it to a place you care about and then move on. Recently, NPR had an article about how hard it is for professionals to spot problems they're trained to find. So, if 83% of radiologists cannot see the gorilla in this image, <laughs> if Gary Kasparov can blunder away his queen in a game where he can see the entire board, but I can only see two thousandths of a percent of my code base on the screen at one time, cut me some slack. But what about all the things? Look, you're not going to be able to learn all of the things, and it doesn't matter, at least not to people like Martin Fowler. Given someone with good, broad design skills and someone who only knows your platform really well, which one would you prefer? Martin will take the one with broad design skills. But what about everyone else who does know everything or <laughs> seems like he knows everything? Well, the trick is don't be intimidated by these people. Learn from them. Pat Metheny gave advice to, or his advice for young musicians is, always be the worst guy in every band you're in. If you're the best player there, you need to be in a different band. And finally, a quote from Dykstra, we shall do a much better programming job provided we approach the task with a full appreciation of its tremendous difficulty, that we stick to modest and elegant programming languages, and that we respect the intrinsic limitations of the human mind and approach the task as very humble programmers. So one last thing, Brandy Brown has some wonderful TED Talks on the topic of shame. Go Google TED Shame and you'll find them. Ash Dryden had a great talk at Ruby Midwest earlier this year touching on this subject as well. This is me on the web. Peace out and flying chunky bacon. Hi everybody, my name is John McCarty. Uh, I am a Ruby developer at LifeChurch.tv. We are a church in Oklahoma City. I'm on the interwebs at Jay McCarty um, and I'm going to avoid the water. I don't know what Dr. Nick has done to it. Um, <clears throat> If uh, at some point in your, in your programming career you're going to get to a point, if you haven't hit it already, of uh, asking yourself this question, what's the point? What am I doing? 
Uh, for me, it came in, in 2010. I was working at a startup, in uh, a B2B startup in San Francisco. And uh, one day, I think on the BART, somewhere between the East Bay and San Francisco, and I asked that question, and it screwed me up in a good way. Um, and so I started asking myself, what is the point of all the stuff I'm doing? I was, was working on an app that really, at the end of the day, wasn't creating any value, um, wasn't doing anything important. And, uh, and so I started by asking myself uh, this question, <clears throat> what do I value? Who am I? What, what matters to me? Is it my family? Is it money? Uh, is it notoriety? What was it? And uh, it, was, it was a really good question for me to ask. And I think at, at some point you, you understand that all of us, there's an intrinsic uh, need for us to belong to something, for our work to matter. Uh, we want to know that we're part of something bigger than ourselves. Um, in fact, you, you can even see this in, in research, especially in this generation. 75% um, of young people polled uh, age 25 to 30, which is narrow, especially since I'm over 30, uh, it, last year donated to causes, 63% uh, said that they gave their time to volunteer. This is a huge jump over previous generations. I think this is something that we're coming to grips with and we're understanding that this is uh, part of our lives and we want, we want something else, something bigger. So for me, what's my purpose? Um, when I was in San Francisco, I came across a guy who told me about this church in uh, Oklahoma City, not on the top 10 list of places I ever wanted to move to. Um, uh, it's a Christian church uh, using technology to reach the world and uh, change people. We, give, we build software for other churches. We give it away for free. The biggest one, uh, if, if, you're, if you're into the whole Bible thing and you have one on your phone, uh, this uh, Uversion Bible app is one thing that we do. It says uh, 90 million installs to date. So that was my purpose, and so my challenge here for you today is what's your purpose? What motivates you? What brings you fulfillment? And the first place, uh, the best place to begin is the beginning. So take a look at your values. What is it that is important to you? Put them in order. Prioritize them in a block if you have to. Find, find the purpose in the work that you do. Managers, make sure your developers know why you're doing things. Even if the, the project as a whole isn't a huge, vastly important thing, um, there is some value in it. And you need to tell your developers what it is and keep reiterating it. Developers, if you don't have a great manager, uh, find, the work in, 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 uh, find the purpose in the work that you do. But my work has no purpose, you may say. Here's a couple ideas. First of all, find it. Again, like I was saying, the project as a whole doesn't have to have massive purpose. But even this specific feature that I'm building is going to save my users time, is going to, is going to change my, someone's life on the other side of the internet. That, there, there's purpose and value to that. Hold on to that. Treasure it. Um, in my case, do something drastic. You're working somewhere, I, for all of the managers here, I'm sorry I'm about to say this. If you're working somewhere and you, you come to this point of, what am I doing with this? Leave. Go somewhere else that, fi that, that, that connects with who you are and what you value. Thirdly, uh, if none of those options work, if you have to stay where you are too, um, find purpose outside of work. There's so many things that you can do with your time, um, with the talents that you've been given as programmers, as developers, as people that understand what a class is. There are things that you can do outside of work, um, whether it's finding a nonprofit in your community that you can give some of your time to, um, give some of your programming time to. Gosh, there's so many terrible nonprofit websites. Please help them. Um, uh, there are organizations that, that will allow you, there are very obvious examples where you can use your skills uh, to, to change the world around you. And finally, um, uh, find or create by. Um, just know that the code that you write today isn't going to be around forever. Uh, most of the code that I write, wrote three years ago isn't alive anymore. Uh, but the difference that you can make in someone's life through the code can last a lifetime. Thank you very much. Hello. Thank you. The, the presenter display up here is fantastically better than any, other, uh, than any of the side rooms. So the keynote speakers, that's why they're able to pull things off and look so fancy. It's, they have like seven screens facing them right now with everything that they're about to do, uh, including that one, which is actually backwards. And it's the largest one. So it's really confusing for the presenter to think that they're projecting backwards slides to all of you. 
<laughs> um, so when I signed up for the lightning talk, it said I was going to talk about code climate. But uh, I figure it's, it's 2013, and uh, it's Ruby. It's a Ruby conference, and everyone wants to hear about security because uh, starting in January, security in Ruby was like, oh my god, we're all screwed. What are we going to do? Uh, and so I give talks about security, but I tend to talk really fast because security is a really deep topic, and there's like a thousand things you need to worry about. So I figured, you know, how can I give a quick lightning talk about how to secure your app in three steps? And that's what I'm going to tell you today. Uh, and then there might be some stuff at the end. So the first thing you need to do if you're a Rails application developer and you want to have security on your application is you need to require authorization. So this is an example of that. Each, each, each uh, step is going to come with one example. So make sure that you build an authorization form <laughs> and, uh, and put that into your application. So, so once you've built this authorization component, it's all about context, right? So you have this, you've built this padlock and you need to install it. So be sure to wrap that all the way around your application uh, so that without the key, you're really not going to have any idea what to do with it. And then now you're likely to be secure, but you really want to know if someone's trying to attack you. So you're, you're going to want to install what the professionals call an intrusion detection system. So I'm going to give you, this is what that looks like. <laughs> now, when somebody is fruitlessly trying to break through that lock, uh, you'll at least have some, some footage of them trying to do that. So now that your apps are secure, uh, <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about um, Security Monitor by Code Climate, which is a, which is a feature that we launched uh, just, just about a month ago, or yeah, about a month ago now, that can help you try to actually secure your, your Rails applications. Basically, you hook your repo, uh, we hook up to your GitHub repo, we scan for about 20 different types of security vulnerabilities, and we generate really usable reports like this that just tell you where you're about to get screwed. Um, so this is Trax, which is an open source app. And if there are any Trax developers in the room, I'm sorry for what I'm about to do to you, because I didn't really think it through that I probably shouldn't demo this um, security vulnerability in your app, but now it's too late. So <laughs> I don't have another example. I apologize. Um, so here's what Code Climate can do. Uh, if you have a developer who maybe doesn't realize that YAML might be an alias for eval in Ruby, and they write, and they write a line of code like this, um, which just takes whatever, you know, conveniently takes whatever a, a user sends to the website in the form of YAML and runs it through YAML load, just in case somebody needs to install some packages on your system that you forgot to install. <laughs> Th this controller will help them do that very easily. Um, so when your developer inadvertently adds a uh, substitute patching <laughs> process to your application, we can actually let your team know about that right away. Uh, and it all sort of comes down to an email like this that we can send out to your team saying, hey, it looks like somebody um, added a line of code that does a YAML.load with params, and you probably want to be uh, aware of that before that goes out to production. So that's what the security monitor feature by Code Climate does. Uh, I started Code Climate uh, a couple years ago, and I've been working on it since. Um, we'd really like for you guys to check it out, and we can try to uh, you know, help you out with, with tracking down issues in your application. It's free for open source, so if you guys maintain open source tools and you want to try out Code Climate for it, you can just set them up. You don't even need to create an account. Uh, and then just like GitHub, if you have private projects, uh, you can set them up and run it through this, and we won't publish your security uh, issues to the world like I just did to Trax. Um, <laughs> so somebody gave a talk about your first pull request. Maybe somebody can patch, can patch this issue for tracks before the end of the conference, uh, and I'll take credit for that. Uh, that's all I got. Thank you very much. Have a good one. Uh, hi. Uh, my name is Sandal Nayam. I'm from Rails Factory. Uh, this is my second RailsConf coming after five years, uh, and I'm the only one speaker who's taking photographs from the stage. I don't know. I, I don't do it these kind of things often. Uh, I, I do it more informally. Okay. Okay, uh, see, choosing smartphones are pretty tough. And uh, we have all made our choices. Okay, so how many people, yeah, I'm going to do a show of hands. How many people love their iPhone, iPad, iPad minis? Wow, quite. Okay, it was a tough decision for you. Okay. How many people love their Samsung tablets, all their S1, 2, 3, 4, 5? Right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> And the rest of people who have made choices, they don't want to show what choices they have made. They would have got a Nexus, they would have got a BlackBerry, could be a Windows Mobile, uh, God forbid, but 
uh, these things happen. These are accidents. Uh, people, people buy it, okay. We developers, we are very subjective. We want to write program in Ruby. We want to write program in Python. We all are very selective, okay. But if you're in consulting business or if you are into a SaaS product and suddenly your customers use all kind of stuff, your customers expect uh, earlier our choices were which browser people were using. Is somebody using IE6? How do you make it work on it? Now, if you build a native application on iPhone, you are testing on about three to four devices. Uh, if you are an Android, and if you want to cover nearly every the market, there are at least 400 phones available in America now. Uh, different screen sizes, different resolutions, different versions of the operating system. Okay. Uh, so th again, the problem comes in. If you are doing mobile web, and your customers want you to support all the devices, or possibly all the devices, but nobody wants to pay for testing. Developers are supposed to write flaw-free code. Don't write bugs, right? You're not paid for doing that. <clears throat> it happens, it happens, okay. So uh, I run a company, I have a lot of developers, but no customers willing to pay for testing. So I said, what can I do? So we spent some time looking at what is possible. So we built a small robot. Uh, it's currently powered by Ruby. Uh, it's scripting currently, but uh, I'll run a small video, and we can have a question, right? Uh, there's no audio, just see what it does. It's a, currently it's a small screen. Somebody's clicking on the link and, uh, okay, so it's, it's a Nexus phone. Uh, it's, it's a reference from a 3D printer. We took something on it, we got a stylus. It clicks on it, right? Uh, I would have loved to show an uh, Angry Birds high scorer game, but uh, I won't do it. Too many people have patented it. I will look like a clone copying it. Yeah. Okay, so long term plan uh, we would love to automate it even further, maybe replicate the keyboard with a Bluetooth simulator or something. Uh, it can test iPad, it can test iPhones, a couple of devices. Uh, I'm trying to write a DSL, it's still not standard. Uh, it still can't do uh, image recognition. I'm looking at OpenCL and other ones. Uh, uh, currently, I've not put any code open source. I've not thought about if should I even manufacture it or put in a Kickstarter. I don't know if they're supporting hardware anymore. Maybe you should go Indiegogo. But all these guys use Rails. I love that part. All right. So yeah, you will see one game here. And a long term, you can simulate, put random stuff. Uh, uh, so-called monkey testing, you can do it with a robot which does random clicks somewhere, right? <clears throat> yeah, so it's scoring a point. So the, there's a laser which targets a particular point, the black point dot. Uh, if it hits it, you score. So level three. Cool, so uh, it can test mobile web applications, it can test uh, apps, but eventually you write your own code. The idea is write the test cases, uh, or record your test cases, whatever you do in phone, and repeat it, right? Good about, about robots is uh, they don't need beer to run, they don't need pizza. <laughs> Probably they don't want to ask any uh, insurance are required, no travel, no vacation, and every year you can replace with a faster one, right? So no ego, right? It can work on any device. It, it doesn't say I will only work on a Mac or iPhone or whatever, right? So this is what we have built. So how many of would, uh, I'm not saying I'm going to sell it, but how many of would like a robot like this to save their uh, time? Show of hands, sir. Thank you, guys. So if people like it, it succeeds. Thank you. Hello. My name is Miles Forrest, and this is cloning the Seattle Ruby Brigade. Ruby and Ruby on Rails have a rich, vibrant, and growing number of conferences to choose from. From multi big multi-track events like RailsConf to smaller regional conferences, they all work to support the community, and that is awesome. But the real strength of our community lies at the local level through Ruby user groups, or meetups, or what our community likes to call Ruby Brigades. This is where people get things done together in person to help each other. 
Want to learn to code? Need to help hacking on a project? Do you dream of building a software as a service business like DHH? Maybe even buy a car like his someday? Ruby Brigades exist to help you, and more importantly, for you to help others. But there's a big problem with Ruby Brigades right now. If you happen to live near a large metropolitan area like San Francisco or Portland or Seattle, then there's probably a Ruby Brigade near you that really rocks. But I probably don't live near a big city. In fact, I don't. I live in Chilliwack, British Columbia, a little town way outside of Vancouver, BC in the sticks, where we have all sorts of wonderful resources for aspiring web application developers like cows and corn. I tried to build a Rube three times, three times, but no matter how much work and planning I did, I kept failing. I kept failing, and it made me sad. With no hope of a Ruby Brigade starting near me, in desperation, I decided that after work, I would leave immediately at 4 p.m. and drive well over 200 kilometers from Chilliwack, British Columbia, Canada, across the border in the United States, and into Washington State, drive all the way to Seattle to the Seattle Ruby Brigade, which meets every Tuesday night at 7 p.m., and then when it was all over, drive all the way back. But it was really worth the drive. Seattle RB was the first Ruby user group in the world, a group that currently maintains over 350 projects from just 19 people. Yeah, that's a lot of code. Every single one of us in this room really relies on the work they do. We literally owe our livelihood to these men and women. The first few months I attended, I hardly talked to anyone, but then I finally mustered up the courage and talked to Ryan Davis. That's right, Zen Spider, a man who loves to hurt code. I mean, people are scared of this guy, but it turns out that Ryan is a heck of a nice guy. He offered on more than one occasion to let me crash at his place if I was too tired to drive home. I told Ryan about my th three failed attempts to start a group, so he shared with me the secret of Seattle RB and how I might be able to clone what they're doing, and it worked. January 10th, 2000. In 2009, three people attended the first meeting of the FBRB, the Fraser Valley Ruby Brigade. We specified the region east of Vancouver, BC, because the cities out in the valley are too small to sustain a club of their own, so we are now in our first year, fifth year, sorry. Oh, sure, we're not very big, but we have an average of four to six people out every week hacking on projects. So now that we know it's possible to clone Seattle RB, even in rural areas, I want to share with you what Ryan taught with me. Number one, forget presentations. Do hack nights instead. Presentations are a lot of work, and if you're trying to build up a Ruby Brigade, you seem to be endlessly chasing people to do a talk. With hack nights, only one person has to show up. No work, no pizzas, no incentives, just hack on code. Number two, bring a project. If a members are encouraged to bring a project they want to work on, then show up wanting to create something rather than consume what others have worked hard to prepare. This attention shift from being a consumer to being a creator has an interesting side effect of repelling recruiters and people who want to look for someone to build their awesome idea. So if somebody really wants to build the next Facebook, Instagram, social media thing for peanut butter lovers, we will help you with your project, but we won't do it for you. So number three, Meet every week. If you want to make progress on any project and you aren't working on it at least every week, your project slowly fades. So if you want to start a Ruby Brigade, especially in a rural area, just commit to set aside about two hours one day a week. You can meet just about anywhere, a local coffee shop, someone's house, a high school, anywhere with free Wi-Fi. You end up being the only one there after a week, so what? You have it's still a hot project to hack on. You never have to chase people down or guilt them into attending every week. The fact that people is, are busy, they have lives outside of Ruby. If people know that there's at least one person meeting at one location every week to geek out and hack on stuff, the likelihood that you have of growing a micro Ruby Brigade of one person into a full-fledged club is very, very high. And that's it. If you want help starting a Ruby Brigade, here's my email address. I've got all sorts of things I could like to share with you, like how you can get a library of books, not PDFs, but actual paper goods for free. So that's how you can close the Seattle Ruby Brigade. And I've got a, well, I got a few seconds. So here's my dog Bailey. One time he got a purse stuck around his neck. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit uh, about an idea that's been in my head for a little while. And it's kind of around the idea of t teaching an old dog new tricks. See, I'm actually part of, of, of a new generation. Rails came about when Rails was kind of the first programming framework that I really got into as I was in high school. I actually got to work on Rails when I was in high school, and that's uh, 2006. Actually, it was 2005 that I actually got to do that. I was so stoked to do that, but that means that I'm part of a privileged generation. And I figure that a lot of you, whether or not you're, or you're around my age or not, you're probably about a part of this similar generation, not necessarily by age, but by the way we work. How many of you work for a company that is less than five years old? Pretty considerable number. How about less than 10 years old? OK, so, so that, that's a fairly considerable amount of you. And that's the generation that I'm talking to. How many of you uh, work for a publicly listed company? A lot less. 
So I've had, had the, uh, the privilege of working for a couple of uh, publicly listed uh, companies writing Rails code. And one of the things that these publicly listed and all of these companies around the world are realizing is that software is taking over the world. I, I hold a firm belief that in the next 10 years, software is going, well, software already take, is taking over the world, but in the next 10 years, we're going to see a massive uptick. And that means one thing, that developers are taking over the world. <laughs> but see, that's an amazing thing for us, because developers now, I mean, you've seen that job board out there. You, you can't walk two feet without a, a recruiter approaching you. If you have Ruby in your LinkedIn profile, even if, even if you mention that Ruby in the Sky with Diamonds is your favorite song, you will get recruiter spam. We are in a unique position. And companies are realizing that developers are holding the keys. And so we've got this thing, it's come out of a lot of progressive companies, but it's leaking out into the rest of the world, and it's optimizing for developer happiness. Now, I love this idea. I love the idea of being able to optimize so that I'm happy, because you know what? When I'm happy, I'm productive. But you know what? I don't think that developers are unique in that. I think we should just optimize for happiness. We should optimize for the happiness of everyone in the chain, everyone in the company, and I think that we as developers actually have a unique position to spread this idea. We have a unique opportunity to spread some cultural change. We face a challenge, however, because you know what? Change is hard. A lot of us are working for companies that are young, and that means that we've got a head start because we have less entrenched culture to deal with. However, a lot of us, uh, and I include myself in this, are working for much older companies. And that means that we have a considerable amount of cultural inertia that we need to overcome. Cultural change is really, really hard. Cultural evolution happens over time. It's glacial. And, uh, and fast cultural change generally ends in considerable rifts where people uh, get unhappy and, and it, it just ends in, in tears. But I think because we are in this unique opportunity as developers, we have a chance. The world is watching how we do this. As we optimize for developer happiness, as we uh, work towards high productivity by actually being happy about what we're doing, loving what we're doing, and working in a, in a better way, the world is watching us. We have a chance to affect change, not just for ourselves, not just for our own industry, but for in all other industries have this opportunity. And because we ha hold the keys right now, we hold the opportunity to affect change. But of course, change is hard. I've, I've worked through two companies and, and tried to affect some of this change and miserably failed once. I'll let you know how the second one goes. But change is hard. And so we face a challenge to actually be able to do this well, uh, to not to be prima donnas, uh, but to actually realize that we have an opportunity and uh, to take that with both hands. So I want to encourage us as a movement, as 1,500 developers, uh, that we can, make a, a, we can make a dent in the earth, we can make a dent in the world, um, just by making a cultural change, by embracing this cultural change and helping others do it. Thank you. Hello. Brought my own water. Uh, my name is Benjamin Fleischer. I work for Mr. Skin. We're a, a media company. Uh, you probably have met me or heard about me, because apparently that's what happens. Uh, I, ma I assumed main, uh, maintenance and development of the metric foo library. It was, uh, development slowed for about two years. Uh, it is now back up. The maintainer of it, the uh, original creator, Jake Scruggs, a uh, really great guy, has handed over the mantle to me. But that really just means that I have admin access on the new repository. I, I would like everyone who is interested in uh, giving their first, first second, or you know, most recent pull request to, to join along. Uh, some things that are new in the uh, metric foo, we're up to version 4.1.2, uh, semantic versioning for the win. Uh, as you can see here, uh, when I was first just trying to get the darn thing to work, I <laughs> did not know about semantic versioning, and I did some awful things to, uh, well, you can look on Ruby gems. Uh, and actually, a number of them that, that I had yanked during the security thing are gone now. Uh, so I, also, there's no uh, cane in it, which is exciting. And you can run, uh, you can use uh, coverage metrics now 
uh, from uh, SimpleCov if you just run it yourself and just set a, set a flag. Uh, so what, try it, create issues, pull requests, help me, help you, help me. Uh, so I just wanted to show there actually is a page for semantic versioning, uh, which is not, it's in a release candidate right now, appropriately. <laughs> uh, and this is really important for gem developers. If you've ever done a bundle install and something broke because it went up a point release, that should not happen. It should be major, minor, patch, where a patch is a bug fix, minor is you added something, and major is you broke something. If you're not following that, you're hurting your fellow de developers and maybe even yourself. I, I have, there's a whole bunch of stuff here. It works in Rubinius and JRuby now. I've done some work on that. Uh, look at the change log, it's fun. Uh, I, I have it running on Travis CI. Uh, thanks to all the Travis people for uh, making that possible. Uh, I have it running on Code Climate. Thanks to Brian for making that possible. And I have to say, I'm actually using Code Climate to work on metric foo. Uh, and I don't think I mentioned earlier, metric foo is a metrics library that combines, uh, <laughs> whatever, it, it, metrics in the name, uh, that combines a number of metrics. Um, for example, uh, here is metric foo running on itself with churn metrics, flay metrics, flag metrics, reek metrics, Rudy, Sykuro, and Kane. What do all those libraries have in common? None of them were written by me. <laughs> uh, I have, uh, in some cases, I've made pull requests or conversations with the developers, but uh, it's, it's kind of interesting. And then there's a hotspot section, which actually was ex originally extracted from the caliper code that Dever worked on. Um, and it's can be pretty useful to helping you find areas where you need work. I ran it on Rails 3. I, I ran it on Rails 4. They have different issues. Um, and this is unrelated, but this is a new site that uh, my company is working on that's coming up this summer. We do not have metrics if you wanted to get into that right now. Um, the other, the more well-known site that I work for is uh, Mr. Skin. And I also wanted to mention, while I'm up here with a microphone uh, and have a minute and a half left, uh, I've started adding pull requests to the Ruby Friends project. This is a project that the Ruby Rogues, if, uh, if you have not heard of them or begun listening to their podcast, you should. Uh, the Ruby Rogues are awesome. They're my favorite group of people that podcast and share their knowledge in the world. Um, woo! Uh, and I began working on the code base because I wanted to make it easier to find all my Ruby friends. Right now it's a stream, so I started working on that. And as a side project, I realized if I change Ruby friends to RailsConf, I can actually sort of track all of the RailsConf tweets. Now there's also a similar group that is Friday Hug, and then I heard there's another one that does uh, something else I heard that I forgot. There's a pair with me. So I actually think this is something for the community that could be really useful. And I've been doing some work on refactoring it. If anyone would like to join me on that, that's great too. Um, if anyone knows any maintainers of Kaminari, I have a pull request in right now to make it thread safe. <laughs> I've, I've emailed them personally. Uh, I believe I've commented on the Twitter. This is a month old. Uh, it's kind of a no big deal. Uh, it, <laughs> that's, that's the whole thing. Uh, Anyway, well, that's it. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you very much for your time. Well, good welcome to every single one of you. Um, I am from Zeal. We are a consultancy uh, out of Southern Oregon. Um, so you'll see there's our big awesome logo. I've been wearing this shirt for three days. I do smell and I am sorry for that. Um, if you wanna know what I look like, this is it. Again, my name is Adam Cuppy, and uh, it comes with the redhead and the territory. Now, here's the deal, um, is that many of us have been involved with uh, client work as a consultancy, possibly. In fact, raise your hand if any of you, any of you whatsoever, have ever had to do a project for somebody other than yourself. Say it with me, I am an idiot. <laughs> Perfect. So the thing is, is that I have learned a multitude of things over time, and those things I would like to bestow upon all of you. That's right. My knowledge will soon be your knowledge, and you too will be stupid like me. Now, have you ever felt while you're working on a project for somebody else that this is kind of what it feels like? 
you know, this is kind of what they're requesting to a certain extent. It's like, I want a Facebook, but this is how I think it's supposed to work. And you, the developer, are an idiot. And I, I the product owner, am smart. Well, the reality is, is that's not true. And all you want to do is kick them in the head. Well, the reality is, is that there's ways past all of this sort of stuff. Now, we are an agile and test-driven development shop. Um, so what that means is that we are in a constant state of continuous learning. Now, what that means is, is that we are in a constant state of planning, and we're in a constant state of looping through the feedback, right? Feedback loops, right? So we iterate. We come up with short, deliverable iterations with our clients, and I recommend that for you guys. And then what you do is you go through that and reevaluate time and time and time again. Ultimately, you get into this really productive, efficient cycle. So the goal here is learn continuously. Now, another way to think about it is we don't get paid for what we know. We get paid for our capacity to learn something new, right? So what I'm saying here is learn. Learn a lot. Learn everything except that. Now, the next thing is that learn socially, right? Now, again, we're an agile shop. So one of the things that we adhere to, because we're also extreme programmers, is that we pair all the time. That means that we've got two devs sitting at one, at one computer at the same time all the time. They test at the same time. They write code at the same time. And that's how we function. And the value of that is that the quality of the code base is skyrockets. And the best thing, the best thing that happens is that it gives everybody the opportunity to learn together. So again, learning socially and have the opportunity to reflect. And the bottom line is that humans do love to work together. They do, right? We try not to, but the reality is we do. Now, the other one is learn horizontally. And what I'm saying here is have a full stack knowledge. Our team is encouraged to have a full stack knowledge. But hey, you know what? We've got JavaScript. We've got DevOps related things with Unix and Linux. We've got Rails, which includes Ruby, obviously. Then we've got the database. We've got all of these components. And that's where pairing comes into play. So instead of trying to hire somebody that knows it all perfectly, instead what we do is we utilize the pairing model to learn socially. We utilize the feedback loops to evaluate collectively, ultimately resulting in a full stack learning opportunity, right? Raise your hand if you went to school for programming. Raise your hand if you taught yourself. Funny how that works. So get to know your neighbors with multidiscipline, par multidiscipline pairing. Now, one of the things that we've seen a lot that is that oftentimes designers are not pairing with developers, right? So how many of you have received what we call like lobbing a PSD over the, over the fence, right? It sucks. You are doing it wrong. Wrong. OK, the right way, on the other hand, is pair your teams together, right? Pair your teams together. Get into a stage of multidiscipline pairing. So that's what Rails offers. That's why we're here is because we love it. Now, I want to take about 30 seconds to tell you we are doing an agile test-driven development conference. It's a dev training. We're currently talking with Mr. Ryan Bates of RailsCast to help us with the curriculum. We've also signed up Kent Beck, who's wrote the Agile Manifesto. He's the father of all of this stuff. So here, October 23rd through the 26th, if you want to know what all of this stuff means, learn it from the masters, and, uh, and we'd love to see you there. So thank you so much. It's been a great three days. Woo! OK. Oh, well. <laughs> OK. Hi, everybody. I'm Hector. I came from um, a Rails consultancy down in Mexico. And I'm here to talk, yes, another freaking conference. But <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be different. So what is MagmaConf? It's a conference. Um, what it's about? Well, you know, it's about Ruby. It's about Backbone. Uh, it's about Ember. And I didn't know the definition of the word Ember. So I looked in the dictionary, and it was like totally Unexpected. <laughs> okay, and of course it's about Rails. Um, MagmaConf Magma is about tools, uh, techniques, and experience of the doing web development. And where is this conference? Well, it is in Manzanillo. It's a small city in Mexico in the Pacific Ocean, and it is not a regular conference. It is a totally different experience. Starting because we have this thing, Magma Village. 
is a set of ten, uh, a set of ten beaches uh, by the by the ocean. Uh, there are like it's just six minutes uh, away from the venue, so it's really really close. You have you can go to the village and go back to the conference whenever you want. Uh, it is a place where you can hang out. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, there are beautiful houses. Actually, this house is the um, Casa GitHub. They name it like that. The GitHubers are going to stay there this year. Um, you can go to a pool, just walk into the beautiful gardens there, but the go to the beach. And the best part is that we have space av available. If you want to stay in the village, you just send us an email and we send you the complete information. Um, also, this, this time, this year, we're going to have a live, <laughs> real Lucha Libre uh, event uh, after the conference. Uh, the Lucha Libre in Mexico <laughs> is like the um, WWE, but better and cooler and like. <laughs> also, we always throw a great party. We know how to do it. <laughs> so, and also, we have a party on the boat. So it's really, really cool. Uh, who has came in past editions? Well, Ron Evans, uh, Scott Chacon, Dr. Nick. Uh, I'm sure that you know this guy. Uh, he was a keynote speaker last year. And this time we have uh, 12 foreign speakers, eight Latin speakers. And I'm very proud to announce that Constantine Hayes is coming because we threw a fundraiser to bring him from Germany to Mexico, and we did it. We raised like $2,000 uh, $2, to, to bring him, and we did it. And also, if you are a speaker, you will get yourself card nice. <laughs> you can watch the full list in magmaconf.com slash path schedule. Uh, this, this is happening this June from the 6, 5 to the 7. And of course, we're looking for sponsors. <laughs> You will, you will get conference passes, a booth in the exhibit hall, and you will be able to interview Mexican talent. Uh, they all want to come and work with you. So, and also it's easy to Mexicans to, uh, to get the TN1 visa to work in, in the States. So it's better for you. So show me the money and be a sponsor. <laughs> so that's it. Hi, hello everyone. As Hector already said, probably you noticed that we work for the same uh, company because of the shirt. Uh, I'm coming from Mexico, from uh, Crowd Interactive, and I want to spend a few minutes uh, talking about uh, logic programming with Ruby. Um, I guess that we here, uh, we do all love uh, Ruby. I um, hope that everyone that's here loves Ruby. Uh, also, uh, probably, uh, like me, you have heard the tales uh, from the beginning of the time when uh, Matt uh, took a different set of features from uh, different languages and uh, put everything together and built uh, Ruby for us. So Ruby is basically a, a component of a different set of uh, uh, thoughts and uh, um, features from a different set of languages. One, one of the uh, paradigms that uh, we have in uh, software development is uh, logic programming. Probably Prolog is the most uh, popular tool that we can um, just uh, remember. It came out uh, to our mind every time that we hear the logical, uh, logic programming. But um, logical programming basic, basically means that uh, we don't need to express how the program should actually work. Instead, what we express is the data and the queries for a, in a specific format. And uh, this will allow us to answer a set of questions. The main blocks for uh, logical programming is basically we have uh, the facts, which are the assertions about what we know from uh, our uh, domain problem. We have a set of rules that express the inferences that we have about this data. And uh, finally, we need the queries, which basically are uh, the questions that we need to answer with the rules and the facts or the data that we already know. So 
there is a way that we can uh, bring this uh, knowledge or this kind of programming into Ruby uh, without actually having to use Prolog. Um, I was interested on uh, exploring different um, ways or different paradigms uh, because a book called Seven Languages in Seven uh, Weeks. And uh, one of the chapters uh, talks about Prolog. So I, I did a quick search about uh, the relationship between Ruby and Prolog, and I found a, a post from someone in Japan hiding in a, a very obscure site talking about this, this gem, which is uh, Ruby Prolog. And basically what it does, it provides you a kind of DSL like uh, that lets you uh, write a kind of prolog uh, syntax inside of Ruby so that you can uh, use uh, this kind of uh, uh, programming. Basically, what we can do is uh, we start with the facts. This is, this is the way that we can uh, define the data or the knowledge that we have already from uh, our domain model. Then we need to set uh, rules which, uh, again, are, are the, the rules that infers what we know about this data. And at the end, we can have uh, queries. And the queries uh, will allow us to answer uh, questions. The only thing that we need to add to this is just grab everything inside of this uh, Prolog uh, core, which um, can, is kind of an instance or context for a, a specific problem so that we can have a uh, different set of contexts inside of the application, and each context will be insulated from uh, um, everything else, and uh, they can work together. Or, if you prefer, well, it, uh, it is not uh, visible, but uh, you can create a class. If, if you feel uh, comfortable with uh, object-oriented programming, you can create a class, and inside of the class, you can put everything together and uh, start um, um, answering questions. Oh, obviously, this gem is not as complete as Prolog. It doesn't have the same kind of performance. Uh, it doesn't have all the libraries that we found in, in Prolog, but it is good enough to try to resolve um, problems in a different way. But uh, actually, the, the main point about it is, is uh, I would just like to ask you to be curious to uh, explore a different set of uh, uh, languages. and. That's it for my part. Thank you. OK, so I'm here to show you guards.js. And it's a jQuery plugin to guard your forms with class or any other selector. And it's pretty simple to set up. If you want to style it manually, you can. Or you can just invoke guards.style. And it'll go ahead and do some automatic styling for you. Uh, and then you can live guard your form. Or you can enable guards traditionally. Uh, the normal enable guards will block on submit, whereas live guard, I'll show you what that'll do in a sec here. Uh, so I, I can guard using required, which, as you might expect, will make sure that it's required. And so that's live guards there. It, uh, it will listen for on, uh, on blur events and, and trigger it then. And so then, as soon as I start typing something, it will go away. And since it's, I put something in there, it's good. So you can also guard with other built-in guards, such as email. And you can chain them together. So I have required here. And I can also guard it using email. No spam, please. And. Uh, I can also guard with a custom function, or I can, and I can also tack on special messages and customize guards in many other ways. So if I type the wrong thing here, it's not going to let me through. And that's it. I'm Mike Ferrata Stone. I work at onsite.com. Here's my email and my Twitter handle. And you can go to guardsjs.com or gem install guardsjs rails to get the gem, the asset gem. Thank you. Um, looks like I'm off center here on the monitor, so uh, half of this might be utterly meaningless. But um, 
if you have tests running slowly and uh, you know that's a problem, but ideally you have fast tests and decoupled code, but the reality is you don't or you won't because somebody else did it. So you're stuck. Uh, how can you get out? There's a way. You can hack your way out. So I'm going to introduce Apple Pie. This is a model under test. It's got a simple job, which is to bake just like mommy does. And its size is very, very big, and you remember that from your days. Uh, that's exactly how mommy made the pies. But its deliciousness is merely OK. And that's not right. You remember mommy's pies were more than OK. And the crust is soggy, and that's not right either. So you're going to defend your mother's honor. And you're going to fix this test. You're going to improve the state of the situation. So simple test, but it's probably like what you're used to seeing. There's some sort of expensive setup and a quick setup. The expensive setup is Factory Girl Create. And that's probably going to cost you a lot. Uh, then the quick setup is just this little method that runs the side effects necessary. So the test is just to, uh, can you see that? Can you see what's going on at all? All right, all right, we'll go for it. So the focus group is the test. It, it has an average opinion. And currently, the uh, average opinion is two. So uh, I don't think you can see that. Uh, so what we're going to do is break this test. And I'm going to run it. Yeah, this is why they say don't do live coding, because I don't think you can see everything that's going on. Today I learned. All right, so it's doing stuff. It's doing a lot of stuff before it gets to the assertion that you want. You get to the assertion you want, and you realize you're going to have a very bad session, because you're going to be spinning on this thing that takes a long time. And this is a stand-in for what could be minutes. Uh, so you decide you're going to fix it. But here you see you're expecting something greater than 0.9, and you're getting 1 third. So let's take a look at the factory and see if we can figure out why this is so slow. So you have an apple pie, but first you have to create the universe. <laughs> so you have a couple options. You can mock it, but how long do you think a mocked universe is going to stand in for the real thing? Uh, you can just give up and just hack it the way we've always done it, or you can go live with this thing. So let's, let's figure out a different tool, a better way, and uh, do something better than than what our daddies did. Require, pry, rescue. And this is a Conrad Irwin module, if you saw his talk last, uh, yesterday. So pry rescue itself is kind of magical. It, it has this like pry.rescue, uh, do uh, like something. And if this fails, instead of bubbling that exception up, it just drops you in a prompt there. You can wrap it around things that you want to debug. But pry rescue mini test is actually not that much magic. It just says, if you get a test exception, like blow up. So we're going to say unless and CI, like we don't want Jenkins getting messed up, but otherwise we could commit this. So I'm going to run it again. Let's see. And we're going to pay the penalty one more time, because this is not mocking. This is doing real code. This is executing things. This is setting up the environment the way you need. It's running. But when it fails, you get, you get a prompt. And so I don't think you see it, but yep. So I'm in, I'm in here. You know, I can say average. Uh, I can edit this. Oh, that was a bad example. Average. <laughs> but you know, I can interact. I can fix things. So, but I can also use another pry feature, which is edit pi dot bake tab completion. Hops you right to where the method is, and I can fix this. So deliciousness was maximum, and the crust was super flaky, if I remember right. So edit, it already reloaded the code. And um, now I can run basically quick setup. And then I can just run the, this method that I'm in, test a pin. And this is a good thing about mini tests rather than RSpec on this one. Boom, passing test. So I didn't iterate it on it because I'm running out of time. Uh, yeah, I'm going to have to close it down. There's a ton of stuff you can do. But the point is, you see that you didn't get the expensive setup. Uh, but you iterated quickly, which is really the whole point of the test to begin with. So uh, if you want more stuff, you can check out Pound Pry. It's a very supportive channel. Uh, you know, there's lots more awesome stuff to have. Uh, you can just kind of people admin. But anyway, so uh, people, ah. people ah. Yes, come work for people ah. So anyway, yeah, I'd uh, love to talk about this stuff. So if you're By interested, way, more. Resolution. Oh, right, resolution. Yep, cool. <laughs> so OK, thanks.
Hi everyone, uh, my name's Dylan Lacey. I work for a place called Source Labs and I'm going to run you through a fun little thing, uh, an open source project called Appium. So what is Appium? Appium is what happens when you mix Selenium with iOS. So Selenium, for those of you who aren't familiar, is a framework for automating browsers. Because you're using a browser, you get a DOM that's just like your user would, and you get JavaScript execution that's just like your users get, because it's running in exactly the same tool your users use. You can use Selenium, and you can say, use this browser on this operating system in this version, and it gives you that. So you can fairly reliably debug stuff, whereas with Headless WebKit, if you have customers who aren't hackers, who so don't use Chrome, they, they might not have browsers that work the same way as Headless WebKit does, also real WebKit. Um, and Selenium can run on remote instances as well, so you can go and spin your code up somewhere else on another machine or on a farm of machines. Um, so Appium is a Selenium server for iOS. Um, native app controls are kind of like web controls, really. I mean, you have text fields that you put text in. You have switches that are basically radio buttons. You have checkboxes. You slide, you scroll, you type, you enter. You have buttons. But if you're not playing a game, it's basically a web app. So you can find things. You can click on them. You can assert them. And that's kind of what a, web integration, uh, what a UI integration test is. So Appium lets you do that. Um, the point of it is to allow you to run your UI tests under automation, because you don't really want to go and run them manually every time you build a new version of your app. So when we test as Rubyists, we love testing. We think testing is great. iOS is a little bit, little bit more wonky. They're kind of like this. They UI test, and maybe they integrate, and maybe they do automation. Maybe they have robots. Our CTO has a crazy robot, actually. Um, but for, for now, we're, we're looking at this open source solution and thinking this is probably a better idea. So how does that actually work? How do you, oh good, the picture did show up. How do you make sure that your tests run on a magic device that you want to connect to without screwing up your code? Well, your test, whatever that is, anything that uses the WebDriver protocol of Selenium, which is basically all of the Ruby Selenium bindings, uh, including Capybara, Water, all the rest. Selenium talks to Appium, which is the server. Appium talks to Apple's instruments.js, which is their UI test framework. And that talks to the Apple emulator, which is probably the best emulator on the market compared to the actual hardware device. If it's not, it's Apple's fault. Go blame them. Um, so some of you probably don't believe me. So this is some code. You create a web driver in the standard way. You say, give it a remote server. And the desired capabilities are your browser, your platform, the version of iOS that you want. You need to tell it where your app is, and you give it a URL. That URL is wherever your Appium server is. It can be remote. It can be local. Um, this is what Appium commands look like. Standard Selenium with a couple of inclusions. You want to put in your input devices and has touchscreen additions to the web driver, so you can you know, play around with the touchscreen and find out where things are. Uh, you find elements by saying what you want to find them by and what they are. You check the values of attributes. You find attributes. You can check the x, y locations of things. You can interact with them by clicking on them. You can assert against their values. When you do things like that switch there, you have attributes should be 0. You click it, it becomes 1. Woo, testing. Um, you can send keys just by typing. You can scroll up and down. Almost all of the commands that are supported by Selenium are supported by Appium, and they keep adding more all the time. Who wants some code? Who wants a demo? Excellent. This is going to go horribly. Yeah. Um, so, so this is Appium on my screen. Ah, that I can download. It's a Node.js program. We're sorry. Um, but the, the end user one you can just download. I added where the app was, and I launch it. It's now running a server. I have RSpec running in this window. You probably can't see. RSpec run UI catalog. Go. That has opened on the other screen again, because damn you, Apple. Um, an iOS device, which is now loading the application and booting up. I'm going to do a jig while I wait. <laughs> Hooray, dignity back. Um, so now it's doing nothing. <sighs> there we go. So it's driving through that. It's doing assertions on the content. UI Catalog is an app that's designed to show off the sort of things you can do with controls. So it doesn't do anything useful, but it has lots of things that are called different things. And you can do different things to them, things, things, things. Um, it's done. That was your entire UI automation test. So if you were running that on a remote server, you could do all of it in parallel. You could do a whole lot of stuff all at once. You can connect them to a grid. You can run them somewhere else. You could pay somebody else to make it their remote server. Um, 
Yeah, do it somewhere else. Run it on the internet. Uh, thanks for listening. Have some free sh uh, stuff. We have a promo code. JOA, I'm trying to give you free stuff. If you put that com promo code in while signing up for Source Labs, we'll give you 1,000 free automated minutes and 200 manual Mac minutes as soon as we release this product, which should be very soon. Don't ask me when. Uh, I have questions at, at DylanLacy.com or Dylan at Source Labs, and I really need somebody to come and give me feedback on our tutorial. So anybody here have a talk on teaching people how to do things and can listen in to it, and I'm talking this fast, come and talk to me, and I'll give you a beer. Thanks. Hello. Sorry. Uh, so this is like the s most smoothly running lightning talks session I've ever been to. This is kind of amazing. So, yes. Uh, my name is JC. I'm from a company in Chicago called DevMind. We build software for money. And I want to talk to you today about apprentices. Um, so I don't know which side of the monitor which of those people is, but uh, this is a former apprentice of ours. Um, this is a current apprentice of ours, um, which is awesome. Uh, this is a improvised standing desk from Ikea and a half-eaten apple that I had to later pick up because neither of them decided they were going to throw it in the garbage. Uh, so uh, before I go any further, how many people are at a company that has an apprenticeship program? Not enough hands are up right now. Okay, So uh, I'm going to talk to you about how we do apprentices, apprenticeship and how we get them and deal with them and make them useful members of society. Uh, so we hire carefully. Um, we evaluate them extensively. They submit an application, um, essays, the whole nine yards. We read it. Everybody on the team reads it. We vote. We say who we want to talk to more. Uh, they go through a coding challenge that is hands off. Um, they fork a repo. They do get some tests to pass. They submit it to us. If we still like them, they come and or I call them and we do a phone screen. Uh, this is all happening over weeks. Uh, they come to the studio and they spend a whole day pairing with us. Um, if we still like them after that, they come again, they spend another day pairing with us. The second visit, they get thrown into the deep end. Uh, they have beers with Brad and I. Um, I it's weird that he's up here with me because that was not planned. Uh, then the entire, the, in <laughs> the entire team votes uh, and we say whether we want to see this person anymore or not. And if we don't, we never see them again. Um, they come from all over the place. Um, we don't require them to have CS backgrounds. So we find good people that uh, are doing good things, and we want to work with them. Uh, we pay them. Uh, these are not interns. <laughs> people need to eat food. Um, so we pay them enough to stick around. Uh, we give them health benefits, because again, people get hurt, and they need to go to the doctor. Uh, we buy them lunch. We also supply them with beer. Uh, pairing. So somebody before mentioned pairing. It's the number one way that we impart knowledge to our apprentices. Uh, two brains, one computer. We pair as much as, the, uh, as an apprentice can stand. Um, we pair just a little bit more than that. Uh, way more than they can stand. And then we almost get them to quit and, and we might back off on the pairing just a little bit. Uh, everybody, all the apprentices get a mentor. Um, so they always have somebody that they can go to. Uh, we do rotate them, so they get about a month of a uh, different person's time. Uh, these are technical and non-technical people. They have regular check-ins. Uh, their job is to instill our values. Uh, number one, we will not ship shit. And number 12 or so, people matter, uh, and all the ones in between. Uh, they do work on client work, not academics. So um, some other programs I know focus on s computer science and stuff, and I don't care. I want stuff for clients. Uh, production code is a good place to learn. Um, we do let them talk to clients because the soft skills are part of apprenticeship too. Good. Um, we do not bill our clients for their time. Uh, they do end up doing some menial chores like cleaning the windows in the new office, but we have to, they make their own tools to do that. Uh, that leads to self-direction. They choose their own adventure. We hire people that are smart and self-directed, and they make an environment where they want to learn, and we support them. They teach other people. Uh, they volunteer at Dev Boot Camp. I have 56 seconds, so I shouldn't have gone too fast on that one. Uh, so we have them present to the team. They read books. They do book reports. They volunteer at Dev Boot Camp and start a league in places like that. They assist us in training engagements. Um, People do matter, and uh, that is DevMind. Um, so I'm doing something that's kind of off topic, and I hope that that's a cool thing. Um, I'm going to start out the presentation by showing you a, a photo of my daughter, because 
Oh, well, a couple of reasons. One is, is that you people aren't nearly as cuddly, and I kind of miss her. Um, the other reason is, is uh, this is actual size. <laughs> and it's actually kind of rare for me to have the opportunity to see her in real life in, on the screen. <clears throat> So the name of this presentation is uh, Optimizing User Adoption. And so uh, everyone here has read the Eric Ries book, Lean Startup and all that. So I just kind of want to talk about kind of a marination of uh, ways that we approach strategy. And strategy means we don't write any software until we think we're going to make some money. Has anybody ever written anything that just basically floated to the bottom of the sea? <laughs> couple of us, perhaps. Uh, I believe I was on a $22 million enterprise project that never shipped. You know, what's a big deal? <laughs> um, in any case, um, there's a couple of things you can do, kind of a way to set your team up for success from a strategy perspective. And to do this, you need to have a data scientist. You need to have a product manager. Uh, who thinks their product manager is useless? Any hands out there? OK. Uh, who doesn't? A lot of you probably just don't even have them, which is uh, a fun, fun idea as well. So let's start off by uh, creating a new term. The new term is called lore. It's the idea that unless you have data to back up what you're saying, it's not true. Um, you can use this term when somebody comes to you and says, this is going to be the coolest feature ever. Everybody's going to love it. And then you roll it out after you know, 80 hours of developing it, and uh, nobody ever touches it. Um, so what we do is we build tests. And a test is basically, uh, you know, big data, that amorphous word that doesn't actually mean anything. Well, big data really means you have a question that you want answered. For instance, is anybody actually going to use this wacky software that I just built? So you build a test, and you use your data to prove it. Um, and uh, of course, the quick way to put that is a limited and concise experiment to test a hypothesis. Um, so as a startup and as a strategy for a startup, you have to have a plan to grow. Uh, that's how you get people to give you a million dollars or five million dollars to build your thing. So you break down your product into goals, and all of those goals must be in line with what you decide to develop. Um, you also have to figure out what the best way to have user adoption is. Uh, so you do variant testing and things of that nature. No matter what you're doing, you have to be moving the needle. If you're not, you're failing. Before you could do this, you have to break your users down into a category, and you have to leverage your existing data to make some preliminary assumptions. Um, <clears throat> and then, of course, prepare all of your user tests. Uh, this is the most common pattern ever. Who here uses Mixpanel or something like Mixpanel? OK, some startups in the hizzy. Um, What's the other one? Uh, Kiss metrics. Yeah, so <clears throat> they're all uh, pretty standard to this pattern, but you might have a different scenario for this. This might look different to you, but in reality, it's just a pipeline for sales. Uh, um, so I'm going to go through that list, uh, that adoption pattern. Does anybody know how much time? Oh, I got a buck thirty. Okay, so you start out with acquisition. How do you get your users? Uh, how much does it cost to get a user? Uh, does making a specific change or lowering the barrier to entry uh, improve your acquisition? Uh, testing pricing models, like what scares people away from pricing if it's $30 versus $100? Um, <clears throat> so how much does it cost to activate them? Uh, test the effects of changing the barrier to entry, uh, and then build a hypothesis around your target demographic or uh, market product market fit. Um, the next stage is engagement. This is when they give you money or they give you the data that you wanted. Um, so what does it take to get to that point? <clears throat> what features are they using? Obviously, don't build a feature that doesn't uh, need to exist yet. How, st uh, how sticky is your stuff? Uh, for instance, when you sign up for uh, Basecamp uh, and then Flowdoc, or uh, sorry, you sign up for uh, Campfire and then Flowdoc comes out, uh, you basically just dump that, that first one and go to the other one because it's cooler, um, because it's an easy transition to the other one. And uh, of course, uh, this is one of my favorite tips is uh, actually just fake a feature before you ever implement it to see if anybody clicks on it. So you put a button up that says, would you like to sign up for this thing? And then they click it, and it says, we'll let you know if we ever implement this feature. Um, and then, of course, the referral stage, which is essentially uh, the idea of virality. It's really hard, and it'll take you to a dark place if you ever try to achieve virality. That's just kind of the way it is. Um, I've run out of time, uh, but there is uh, adoption patterns and fun. Thank you.
Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Jeremy Green. I'm from Norman, Oklahoma. I have a consultancy there called Octolabs. Uh, I'm going to talk about Gym Loop and Easy Marklet. And I was a little overambitious in thinking that I'd be able to get to SimpleDB as well. So I will just barely mention that, but only to not disappoint anybody that's interested in it. Uh, so Gym Loop, what is it? It's a way to judge the relative weight of a gym before adding it to your gym file. It uses a bookmarklet to add new information to pages on rubygems.org and Ruby Toolbox so that you can see the entire dependency tree for a gym that you've come across. Uh, what is a bookmarklet? It's a mashup of the words bookmark and applet. Uh, it is basically some JavaScript from your own site that you can inject at the user's request into a remote page. So I, I know what you're thinking. What are we talking about? Cross-site scripting for fun and profit here? No. Be nice. Use your, pro use your powers for good. Um, so a quick demo. Say you're looking at devise on rubygems.org, which is a great gem. You should use it. Um, you hit the bookmarklet that you've dragged into your bookmark bar, and you get a little report here that shows the full dependency tree of everything that's included in that gem. You can look at it and see that most of this is Rails-based stuff, which you're already going to be using anyway, so it's really not adding a whole lot of weight to your uh, new project. Two slides that were demoing that in case the network wasn't working. So Easy Marklet, uh, what is it? It is Easy Bookmarklets. Uh, it's a gem to help you create bookmarklets for your Rails app. It's something that I extracted from a project that we did that was using bookmarklets to capture URLs that people were interested in that we needed to get into our app. Uh, it packages a bunch of boilerplate code that uses easy XDM to allow you to do cross-domain communication from your site to the remote site that the person is looking at. Uh, definitions for doing this kind of communication. You've got a consumer and a producer. The consumer is the code that is loaded into the remote page that ends up giving you the, the little pop-up frame. Uh, the producer is the code loaded in your own page that is going to provide some kind of functionality from your site and allow you to communicate back and forth between the two. Uh, it has uh, methods for generating a wide, a wide range of bookmarklets from very simple ones that will just capture the URL that you're currently looking at and redirect you to your app, all the way up to what I call the deluxe bookmarklet, which gives you an, embed an embedded frame that is fully navigable that will keep the RPC channel open. So it basically injects a buffer iframe into the remote page that always stays there uh, to keep the RPC channel open. Inside of that, there is another iframe that is the navigable frame that you can use to click around and move back and forth. Uh, when you need to communicate from one frame to the other, uh, if the consumer wants to ask the producer to, some, to do something, it's going to go through that buffer frame. And likewise, the other way, the producer uh, goes through the buffer to communicate with the consumer. Uh, it takes advantage of the asset pipeline to make it easy to see all of your bookmarklet related code in one place. Uh, with EasyXDM, the native way to do it is you have one uh, consumer file for your JavaScript, another producer file, and there's a lot of stuff that you have to duplicate between the two that says there, he, these are the methods in the consumer that the client can call and vice versa. Um, so you end up with code that looks something like this that just lets you define everything all in one place. Uh, and then it uses some JavaScript that comes packaged with the library to pull that out and make everything work. Uh, SimpleDB, it's a NoSQL style key value store that uh, Amazon runs. I think of it a lot like S3 for objects. Uh, their AWS SDK gem makes it pretty easy to interact with it in an active model style ORM using the AWS record model class. Uh, you add AWS SDK to your gem file, declare a class, and since there's no schema or database to inspect, you have to do things like string adder to uh, tell it what the values are that you want to store. And finally, uh, completely unrelated to anything, if you don't know about starlogs.net, you should look at it. It's a great way to make your uh, commit history epic.
All right. First of all, I just want to give it up for the fantastic volunteers from Ruby Central, especially the new directors, Ben, Evan, and Marty. Come on, let's give it up for them. Everybody works hard here. I'll give up some of my time for that. It's worth it. All right. So, Ruby on Robots. So is innovation dead? I mean, are we just like going to be relegated to doing web development for the rest of our lives? I mean, is that all that there is left in technology? I say nonsense. I mean, there's innovation all around us. Like William Gibson said, the future is already here. It's just not very evenly distributed. So I'm Dead Program on Twitter, also known as Ron Evans in the real world. I work at the Hybrid Group, we're a software development company based in Los Angeles. And we're also the creators of Kids Ruby. Thank you. Also, thank you to all the volunteers that helped us with our fantastic Kids Code Camp that we had last Sunday. So we're introducing R2. R2 is a Ruby micro framework for robotics and physical computing. It supports multiple hardware devices, different hardware devices, and multiple different hardware devices at the same time. In Ruby? Seriously? Yes! Because we use Celluloid, which is an incredible piece of software created by Tony Arciaghi that lets you use an amazing kind of messaging to create incredible concurrency. It runs very well on JRuby and the Ruby of the future, Rubinius. So it also works on MRI, but without all the awesome concurrency. The current hardware that we have supported already in R2 today is the Arduino, the AR drone, the Roomba, and the Sphero, with lots more hardware platforms coming very soon. So we have a domain-specific language in R2, which is very reminiscent of Sinatra. Here's an example of a very, very simple R2 program that makes an Arduino LED blink. So first, we require R2. We make a connection to the Arduino using the Fermata protocol. We connect to a device, which is the LED, on pin 13. And then the work that we're going to do is that every one second, we're going to LED.toggle, which flashes the LED on and off. All right, well, flashing LEDs, that's cool. How about drones? So we can also, in this tiny little example, we can require R2. We can make a connection to an AR drone. We can use the device, which is the drone. And then the work that we're going to do in this case is we're going to start, take off, and then after 25 seconds, we're going to land. Then after 30 seconds, stop so we don't just completely crash. So it has a REST API, because what good is a robot if you can't control it over the intertubes? And more importantly, it has a WebSocket API so that you can get real-time notification updates from the sensory equipment that's in your robot. Yes, but that's not all. It has a CLI because you want to control your robot from the command line. It's so cool. So join the robot evolution because the future's already begun. Uh, tomorrow during lunchtime, we're going to have uh, 10 Sphero robots available for everybody to play with uh, in, I believe it's room 140, so that the robot evolution, you could be a part of it. Would you rather Skynet just destroy you or call you mom or dad? <laughs> so R2.io, check it out, fully open source, help us help you create the next generation of robotics technology. Thank you. Hey there, everybody. Uh, so I wanted to talk today about uh, Redis key management, but first, I'm Owen, and that's actually how it's spelled. And I work for this awesome company in Boulder called Gnip. Uh, and I was getting jealous of all the cute stuff people were showing, so here's a picture of my dog. He's, <laughs> he's looking sad because we're leaving for work. Um, so in Redis, typically when you're working, you're going to have like one concept mapping to different keys and have different relationships with those keys. Uh, but managing all that is super tedious. There's copying strings here, copying strings there, remembering uh, when the process shuts down, I need to go delete that key or remove myself from a set or something like that. And you know, we don't believe in that in Ruby. We believe in meta programming uh, and cute names. So I have this gem called breadcrumbs that will hopefully make this a little bit easier. So I'm going to tab over. Can everyone see that OK? Is that horrible? Yeah? Uh, no one's booing that loud? All right, cool. Um, so the main way this will work, you can set up you know, your little like Redis connection, and it unwraps things like Redis namespace. Um, and you describe in this DSL what keys you own. So in, in Rescue, which is the example I'm using, and I just remembered I forgot a slide, uh, a rescue worker owns a key that marks what he's doing, a key when he started, and he also adds himself to a set of other workers. 
So we can just nicely describe uh, that relationship here. And we do things like uh, template it with ID. So when we track a worker, his particular ID will, will show up in that string. Um, and then this rest is boilerplate. But the important part here is we have a little clean method. So we can, we can ask the breadcrumb to clean up after ourselves because we're super messy. So if we run this, we come down here, and it's, it's registered itself and has all these awesome keys. And we can even look inside, rescue workers. And it's got even more stuff in it. It's crazy. Um, and then if we come back up, we say, yeah, go ahead and clean. That'd be, that'd be really great. And now it, it cleaned up, and that's awesome. So the other thing we can do is you can tell the breadcrumb to track state, track the keys uh, that you've described um, in another key, because you know more keys is always awesome. Uh, so this is the exact same piece of code we just added in this tracked in. And we're saying, every key that I record is going to go into this other uh, bucket over here. So it's like the same, same deal. And then if we look at it, we have the same rescue worker set as before, the same started key as before, but we also have this new track keys thing. And I'm going to do some live copy and paste as opposed to live coding. That's how extreme I am. Um, and that looks horrible on this tiny, tiny screen. But we actually just record the commands we're going to use to clean up after ourselves. Um, and so you may be asking yourself, why would you do that? Why would you shove JSON in another set for no good reason? And that's because a lot of the problems I was facing were I wanted to rename things, um, but you know, if I, if I was doing some refactoring, I needed to like, remember that I still have keys out there named the old way, and that's annoying and error prone. So let's say for a very, very good reason, we, 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 we renamed started to started at, um, and then we did our error quotes refactoring down here where we monkey patch rescue worker and, and tell it to save and to start it at. Uh, so if we look at that now, that's all, all fine and dandy like before. We have our new started at thing, but we also have the old started key. Um, and so we know that when we clean up, we want to get rid of that thing. So if we come over here and tell it to go ahead and uh, clean up the worker, when we come back, all we're left with is that track key set. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's my little breadcrumbs gem. Uh, maybe you'll find it useful. Maybe even I'll go put it into rescue, because I like it. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Thanks for listening to me. Hello, my name is, is this on? OK. My name is Doug Smith, and I'm with Dave Ramsey's web development team. I work on DaveRamsey.com with 40 awesome developers, and we are hiring. Um, in Nashville, Tennessee, so check us out. Uh, I'm here to talk about two-step deployment for Rails. So first of all, let's talk about the classic Capistrano one-step deploy process. Since you all hate raising your hand, I won't ask you to raise your hand because the other speaker uh, pulled that, uh, confirmed that for us. But if you're using Capistrano and you do a cap deploy, we're all used to it, pulling our code from GitHub, doing an asset pre-compile and doing a bunch of other things, linking things and possibly restarting your unicorns or whatever. And this is awesome, unless you're deploying to multiple environments, like a staging environment and a production environment. Because when you go to production now, Capistrano has to go ahead and do pull your code from GitHub, do your asset pre-compile again, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and restart your servers. So what's the problem with that? Well, first of all, staging and production might end up running different code. Not that your code on GitHub might change, although it might, between the time you go from staging to production, but anything could happen in that process. Your assets might compile it differently. There's risk there. Um, the other thing is that your production would require extra dependencies, the dependencies required to at least um, compile those assets and whatever else it might need to do. Those are required in that process. So that's why we are using this two-step process with an awesome stair step. The first thing is we build a deployable package or an artifact almost like uh, our keynoter talked about a war file, but in a, in a little bit of a different way. Then we take that package and we deploy that same package to all the other environments. So why do we do that? It gives us a consistent code coverage con or consistent package to deploy to all the environments, and it also reduces those dependencies that we have in our production environment. So how does that work? Well, we start with 
uh, normal Capistrano command, but we add this build, cap build deploy, because we've created a build environment that's specific for building this package. And we run this on a special build server that looks an awful lot like our production server, so it has you know, all the similar constraints and similar um, dependencies on that build server, but it builds this package for us. So it does what you might expect. It exports the code from GitHub. It runs our whole test suite. So of course, we don't deploy anything that the test suite hasn't, um, where the test suite hasn't covered and, and passed in, in 100%. After that, we compile our assets, and then we pull all the gems down. So now we have this package with tested code, pre-compiled assets, and all of our required gems. Then we use that package, and we push that package out to staging and production and whatever other environments there are to, to push that package out to. So what does the deploy process look like? Well, it looks an awful lot like Capistrano normally, except we just put in the environment we're going to use, and we pass in the name of the directory that's the release um, name that Capistrano gave, and we pass that on to, uh, to Capistrano to push to whichever environment we're pointing to. In this case, we're deploying to staging. How do we do that? We use rsync, and rsync simply pushes this this uh, package of files to whatever environment we're deploying to. And all we have to do is rsync and then do the graceful unicorn restart, since we're using unicorn in our environment. It's really a simple concept, but it's very powerful and gives you this, uh, this level of quality that, um, that you might be missing in the, typical in the typical process. So real quickly to look at some code, all we're doing is overriding Capistrano's update code method with an rsync command. I have a gist of this. If you want to take a look at it, you're welcome to contact me afterwards if you're, if you're interested in this kind of, because it's kind of you know, verbose. But the idea is you just simply override what Capistrano typically does when it pulls the code from GitHub and use rsync to push that code instead. So in summary, build once, deploy that same package everywhere, and your, uh, your quality of your deployment will increase that much more. If you'd like more information, these slides are available on SlideShare. Um, you can email me at dougsmith at daveramsey.com or arogos on Twitter. And look at our developwithpurpose.com blog where we talk about the job openings that we have available at daveramsey.com. And I'm honored to share the stage with such awesome speakers. Thank you for listening today. Hey, guys. So I'm Andrew Cantino, and I'm here to show you Hugin, which is a project I've been working on. If you have questions about it later, you can find me on, tech, uh, on Twitter as Tectonic. So uh, Hugin is named after one of the ravens of the god uh, Odin, who flies around the world and looks for knowledge and brings it home. So, uh, and it's online on GitHub, and I'm just going to show it to you guys. So uh, Hugin is a system for building agents that gather information about the world and act on your behalf. So um, it's an open source product. It's, it's MIT licensed. You run it on your own server or on your Mac or whatever. Um, and let me just give you a quick tutorial about how it works. So in, in uh, Hugin, you make a bunch of agents. Here's the default ones. Um, but I have a much longer list on my personal one. And so like, for example, this is the SF weather agent. So all this does is basically a cron job right, with a GUI. So every day, if I edit this, and I may not have internet, which is OK. I expected that. Um, so if you edit your uh, weather agent, you say when you want it to run, which could be you know, constantly or at a specific time. In this case, it's just an instance of weather agent. So all it's going to do is get the weather for this zip code. And it's going to output that as an event. Quick another example. This is another agent. I can make a Twitter stream agent. It follows the Twitter stream. It looks for specific keywords. It runs at a, a frequency that I want and outputs those as events. And then I can make agents that consume events. So there's a flow diagram here. So this is a digest email agent. It runs every morning at 6 AM and emails me if it's going to rain that day. I could add other stuff too, though. If I wanted the you know, XKCD from yesterday, I could also throw that in the email, et cetera. And this is obviously just customized with a JSON here. This is actually just some editable JSON. Now, these are configured as a flow diagram. So this is an example from my personal one. Um, you, I showed you the uh, SF weather agent, um, but it, that weather could be intercepted by other things. So instead of getting the weather every day, I could have it tr go to a rain trigger, which is an instance of a trigger agent, and that triggers only if a certain JSON field has a value I want, in this case, the regex rain or, or storm. And then if that, when that will generate an event, which is consumed by the morning digest agent. So there's a flow diagram here. There's a few other things going on. I want to show you a couple other things you can do with it, one of which is um, that Twitter stream agent again 
Here I've listed a bunch of terms of things that I'm interested in. I'm interested in machine learning, artificial intelligence, the CFP for RailsConf, which is over now, and uh, updates about NASA Mars, et cetera. So what it's going to do is gonna, it's going to consume the uh, stream from Twitter for these terms in real time and then roll them up, and every five hours it's going to output summarized counts as events. And those, in turn, can be consumed by a peak detector agent, which looks for a peaks in a stream. So here we see uh, one of my terms was new Xbox, and there was a peak uh, around the 24th when there was some rumors about what it was going to have in it. And when a peak is detected, it sends me an email. So basically, I can make standing alerts about things that happen in the world. I say, I care about this and this and this. Send me an email if these happen. Um, finally, one other quick thing you can do with it, and actually, this I haven't figured out an awesome use for this yet, but I think the data is really cool. There's a little open source um, system that can run on your iPhone, and it phones your location and any motion vectors every, and whenever you change uh, cell towers. So this is phoning into it. It's making events going to the same event feed, and they could, you, know, you could do anything you want with it, have a trigger when you go to a certain location or whatever. Finally, since I think I actually have a minute, one tool that you may find useful um, if you're building these agents is Selector Gadget, which is another thing I made quite a while ago, but I think it would be good for you guys to know about. Selector Gadget is a bookmarklet. I think it would work well with Easy Bookmarklet. It's useful for finding selectors for scraping pages, which is something I do a lot with Hugin. So here's an example of Selector Gadget running on uh, the RailsConf um, talk list. Let's say I wanted to get the titles. I click on, a, on an element I want. It, highlight, it makes a best guess on what I want. So it says, I think you want H4s. But unfortunately, these are also H4s. So now I, they're red, and I reject things I don't want. And now it says, oh, I think you want talk 60 H4, because that is, in fact, what you first clicked on. No, I want more general. So I click on this. It says, oh, you want main wrapper H4, which is, in fact, the best selector for these titles. So that's also a useful tool you, may, you might find helpful. Thank you. <laughs> OK. Um, Hi, um, my name is Tani Nanakon, and today I would like to talk about the internationalization of Rails with inline editing. So um, the problem that I have a while back ago, which is to copyright the website, you know that, like, for example, you have a button on your web page, and you want to write its label. So at first time, you write it as safe, and then your friend who is not an engineer or your coworker, maybe they in the marketing team or PR team or media team, they would like to change the label or this button to create. And then after a few days, they want to change it again to save now. So um, this kind of problem kind of, uh, it's kind of tedious and then it's kind of a mundane task. So back then I, I built a gem where you can inline editing all those texts on your website. So here's how it looks. Um, I'm actually I'm going to show you a demo right now. Uh, oh, okay. Um, like for example, right now you're gonna have you can you're gonna see like you have a label here. You can click on it. You can edit it. Um, it also works with attribute within HTML tag. So you can like paste here, something like this. Then you can save it, and at the end, you can turn the edit mode off, and then it will be just like a normal text within Rails. So, um, so that's the demo. So um, what, what it actually does here is that it decouples the copywriting from an engineer. So all the media people or PR or marketing, they can go directly to the website and then activate the edit mode, and then they can edit the text by themselves, and you don't have to go through the source code and then like change some text and then redeploy with the, with the new YAML file. And actually what you are doing here is that you're empowering other people so that they can directly manipulate uh, the website by themselves. And at the end, we, will, we all are happier because you are happier because you don't have to um, perform the tedious mundane, ta mundane task of changing text on the website. And your friends or your customer are also happier because they don't have to ask you to change the text for them. And yeah, so we are all happier with, with this kind of empowerment. 
And this is how you can use it. In the, ra in the layout for Rails, you can include this JavaScript file, which will, which will include the JavaScript and CSS for this gem only when the edit mode is activated. And then in your views, you just use it like a normal, normal international life function for Rails, like you use like T and then you give it a name. And within the attribute, you have to use another function, which I name it TA, placeholder like this. And then in your application controller, when you want to activate edit mode, you can just call this function, and then the edit mode will be activated. So you, you can imagine that you can guard this function with a session from your, you know, from your administrator, admin people, or marketing people that work with you. And that's it. Please check out my, the gem URL here, which is, um, uh, <laughs> sorry. Okay, it's, it's tanin47 slash who wish underscore word. And this is my Twitter account, so if you have any questions, just ask me on Twitter or ask me in person. Thank you very much. All right, uh, so I came all the way from, can you hear me, guys? Yeah, you can, all right. So I came all the way from France to bring you gourmet service objects, so it's not cheese, sorry about that. All right. Uh, over the past few years, I tried to extract as much business logic as I could from my models to put them in a service. And so a service object basically is an object that does only one thing, and it has only one method, which is cool. All right, let's go. So that's basically how I make my services objects right now. So services, they live in app services, not in lib, because there is no point putting them in lib, so they are in services. Uh, the class name starts with a verb. Like, for a while I had like user service or whatever. Now they are like sign up user or process transaction or import batch file or things like that. They have only one method, which is the call method. It takes arguments. What's really interesting about using the call method instead of like run or perform or sign up is that actually this is the kind of method you can see everywhere. Not everywhere, but anyway, in lambdas, in procs in method objects as well. They all have this call method. It's really interesting because actually that means that you can just like swap out a service for a lambda. So if you are like crazy about object-oriented programming, then you can also inject dependencies. So you have an initializer that takes the dependencies and uh, your call method will just take the context, like what you want, where you want to uh, apply the action on, that's the user. And using like that dependency injection, it helps you um, testing actually, and be like, all right, I want to test uh, what happens when set avatar, this method fails, let like it returns false. So I want to test that when I set, when set avatar fails, um, my user should not save. And so to do that, you're gonna create a nice Ruby spec, R spec stuff. Um, and so you, you can, you're gonna create a user, set up a service, step call, score, call return false, and you just check that your user should not receive save. But since you're using the call method, uh, then you can just actually switch that to use a lambda instead. And that means that you can also just define a service as, a service like this, really simple, you can just define it as a lambda. And so it makes actually creating like very, very small services really easily. All right, that's it. Thanks for listening. All right, uh, this talks about builder. Uh, it's just like the normal word, but without the vowels. Um, it's a minimalist temp JSON templating DSL. Um, there's an obvious uh, draw tie together or pun there. If you, if you get it, it's smaller, it's minimalist. Um, that's the URL, github slash AJ Sharp slash builder. Um, so uh, what is builder? Um, it's a DSL to create JSON objects from Ruby. It's very similar to uh, Rabble, or uh, I think there's another gem called JSON builder. Um, it's very, very small. There's four core API methods, which I'll uh, show you examples in a minute. Um, the idea here is if you're creating uh, APIs with Rails, um, you need something, you need, you need to treat your, uh, treat your JSON responses as a view layer concern uh, or a templating concern. Um, so Builder has support for 
uh, Rack, uh, Sinatra, and Rails 3.2, and we've been using it at Zarly for about two years now. Um, so uh, I, everyone usually sort of starts out with a, as JSON here, um, and it's more scaffolding than anything else. If you're using it in production, you should uh, probably take a look at something like Builder or, or Ravel or JSON Builder. Uh, I obviously happen to think uh, Builder is a, is a much better way to do these things. Um, so this is a very simple uh, post object that you're trying to render. Um, so uh, one of the, the core API methods is object. Um, the idea here is to stay very, very close to uh, the JSON primitives uh, that we're rendering to. Um, so that's pretty straightforward there. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Builder also has collections. Um, so a collection is just going to render an array of JSON objects. Um, and uh, a, the collection method works like any sort of Ruby enumerable where uh, it's going to emit uh, the individual object to the block. Um, you also see there uh, on the last line attribute. So attribute takes a block. Um, and so you can do special things like, you know, if you need to render ISO 8601 timestamps, et cetera. Um, you can also do nested collections for uh, more complex responses. So if you need to re render a collection of posts and each post needs to uh, render a collection of comments, uh, that's really easy to do in Builder. Um, this is how you, how you use it with Rails and Sinatra. Um, with Rails, there's no setup required. You don't have to do anything. Um, and you uh, locate your builder templates, and just like you would any other template, uh, you'd call it you know, an, an index template, some, something like index.json.builder, um, just like you do index.html.haml or erb or whatever. And with Sinatra, uh, you do have to do, uh, you have to register the Sinatra extension, um, and uh, wherever your Sinatra views directory is, that's where you put your builder templates. That's it. I'm AJ Sharp on Twitter. Uh, check out the project and uh, let me know what you think. Thanks. Hello. Let's do something really stupid. <laughs> all right. So we are basically, I will admit it up front, we are going to do, be doing evals and all of the uh, kind of caveats that come therein. Yes, this is a bad idea. I came to RailsConf. I saw every talk. I conquered everything. I've gone back and overnight, powered by coffee, I've replaced everything I have with SOA everything. Sweet. Now what? Let's look at your edge service, the one that you're actually having your clients deal with. I hope you have mobile apps and you, uh, they're really popular. And strict rest, as we know, is not chatty at all. Um, there's absolutely nothing that's going to be wrong with trying to fire off nine uh, consecutive HTTP requests and dealing with the wonderful world of the soup that is a uh, telephone data network these days. Also, I don't like restarts. You might have gotten this theme from my talk if you witnessed it today. And let's remember that Ruby is a scripting language. So I think you can see where this is going. Uh, so JRuby ships a scripting container, which forms the basis of its compliance with JSR 233, which is the standard for uh, scripting languages on the JVM. And so, oh, look at that. It looks like Rack. So we've got a little rack-ish uh, blob of code here that we're going to have the container parse into a object. And then now it's parsed once, I can call it over and over again. So now I can basically have arbitrary code uh, responding to my rack requests on the JVM. And here's my terrible idea, middleware. So we can actually put all those things into a repository. And in a repository, we can basically say for a given path, we can use a given set of code. And where are we going to put that code? In a database, of course. And so we can pull that code, and then it'll parse. And we can you know, do all the op optimizations. We can memoize and cache everything so we're not pulling things unless we have to. Uh, we can put A-B testing and canarying and all that stuff in if we want to. And then uh, you know, a little more practical example, we're going to pull a user based on a supplied user ID and get their favorites as well and put both of those in a single packet. This is for a mobile device so that we only have to do one HTTP request instead of two. Uh, you can see the two uh, requests that we make out to the user and favorite repositories. Uh, for those of you in C-sharp land, you know what that means. Um, so we pull those two objects, we render them to JSON, and we ship out the response. So now I can deploy new edge endpoints, whatever I want, because I can correlate the path to a block of code. Sounds a little bit crazy. Let's look at the Netflix front-end architecture. This is the diagram of how it works as everything turns 
yellow. Uh, looks pretty straightforward, but what is this labeled endpoint code? That is not the right symbol. That's, that should not be a data source. So they actually do this. Because they have a, a thousand different devices, they have different sets of endpoint code for every single device. And the client teams are actually in charge of deploying all this code. And then they stick it in their Cassandra clusters. And then the code is loaded up from there and then run, evaluated and run. So advantages of this approach, we can instantly deploy and roll back uh, endpoint code. Uh, multivariate testing and canarying is trivial. We can test these uh, endpoints simply because they're simple functions. Uh, I'm not going to use the F word. Uh, we can track what code is exactly running every single endpoint response. And it's polyglot. JavaScript, JRuby, Groovy, Clojure, uh, Jython, Scala, everything else that's going to run as a script on the JVM uh, is at your service. Of course, when has anything ever gone wrong with uh, code evaluation like this? And I sure hope your database can uh, hold up. And then uh, it should be fun if you end up having some kind of process maturity uh, problems or drift. Uh, putting code in a database is a little bit different than having it in a source code repository. We can actually keep track of what's going on. I'm done. I apologize, this is my first talk I've ever given, so. So originally I wanted to talk to you about a passion of mine, uh, and that was embracing a child's curiosity, but that's not really what I wanted to talk about. I just wanted to talk about curiosity. And that really isn't really what I wanted to talk to you about either. It was more about wonder, that sense of awe, that lightning, or that light bulb effect that you get when you find something that just absolutely amazes you. I want to start off by talking about puzzles. Um, I'm a huge fan of puzzles. I, I love puzzles, uh, any kind, Sudoku, those of you who uh, you might not know about Kokuro, it's kind of cool. Um, but the one I want to talk to you about is the Rubik's Cube. And the Rubik's Cube is so simple. It's plastic with stickers on it. But it can keep a child, and me sometimes, occupied for hours and hours upon end. Um, if you hand one to a kid, a, their, light, their eyes will light up, they will just spend hours thinking about how this thing works and want to take it apart and look at its inside and how it works. So I like to think about work kind of like a Rubik's, uh, Rubik's Cube, uh, typo there, uh, like a Rubik's Cube, kind of a puzzle to try and figure out. So it's being inquisitive, thinking about the problem that you have and trying to take it apart and rebuild it. And sort of, the, sort of the person that I think about when I think about being inquisitive is this guy. Uh, uh, I love Calvin, he kind of gets into trouble sometimes, but uh, he finished uh, his, his career in the cartoon world, Bill Watterson uh, finished him uh, with this saying, it's a magical world, Hobbs old buddy, let's go exploring. So I like to think about coding as exploring, finding new ways to do things, but in being curious, Please don't do this. Don't kill yourself. That's why, that's why I went with the child analogy over the cat, because curiosity killed the cat, not the child. Um, and, and of course, we find Ruby the thing that we want to we spend all our time on, but Ruby isn't the only thing we should be, should be curious about. Things like Python. Python has a lot to offer. Um, and learning about Django yesterday one of the talks was awesome. That piqued my curiosity. I'm going to be spending some time on that. Um, things like Go, uh, Rust, uh, Steve Plavnik uh, kind of got me interested in that. E even Java. Um, and if you haven't subscribed to Ruby Tapas, this has changed the way I look about Ruby. Uh, look at Ruby. Um, I have never been amazed by Ruby so many times and so consistently in my entire life. So I highly recommend. You, you take the time right now and subscribe. It's totally worth the $9. So uh, my thought is go be curious, go exploring. Thanks. Ooh, nice. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? No, I know it's not a laptop. Yeah, it's an iPad. I seem to be the only one using an iPad for this, so obviously I'm not going to be doing any kind of a presentation or anything. 
Uh, this is actually two talks. Uh, I'll give both of them if I have time. The first one is titled People Are Like Apps. It's my excuse to talk about apps and uh, psychology, two of my favorite topics. Uh, the takeaway of this talk is that, uh, to, uh, is that there is more to people than you know, and uh, by reducing what you don't know you don't know about them, you can become better developers, peers, and human beings. Uh, some additional disclaimers, uh, I don't actually view people as apps, you know, uh, it just makes for a very useful Rosetta Stone. Um, and this could probably have used more love, I've rewritten this, you know, a bunch of times, and it's just a five minute talk, so as a wise man once said, fuck it, we'll do it live. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, so the first one is pretty obvious, apps can be written in various languages, and some are multilingual. Uh, all have varying language versions and patch levels, uh, that is to say that the words you use can mean different things to different people, or just mean complete nonsense. Uh, apps have APIs. If I submit the query, what is your birthday? A, queer, a, uh, a clear API might return a date or a date time, while a stringent one might throw an error for not specifying if it's in dog years or human years, and a confusing one might just return it as a number of milliseconds since you've been alive. Just because you can send or receive messages doesn't mean you know how to communicate. So what kind of API are you? How resilient is your code base when dealing with troublesome APIs? And what can you do to be a better API? Uh, apps can be poorly coded. Some were coded by poor coders who were coded by poor coders who were trying to create the next great app. Others had to rely on scaffolding and generators and are just glad it's working at all. And of course, some were programmed, very, uh, sorry. Some were programmed by very skilled programmers and are of absurd quality. Uh, the next thing is they often have failing specs and go ignored despite using continuous integration. Uh, they typically have brittle tests and uh, false positives or negatives. The psychologist Albert Ellis coined the term masturbation to describe the tendency to phrase healthy preferences into unhealthy absolutes with the use of words like must and should in our daily speech and thinking, an irrational expectation is created that is likely to be brittle if not fail outright. For example, I must give an eloquent speech, otherwise I will never be accepted by the community. Uh, let's see, the next one is apps can be hacked and manipulated. This talk itself is really just an attempt at code injection. Uh, no app is used by everyone, and those that do use it likely accept it with some reservations. They may criticize, leave for something better, stick around forever, or seem unable to decide at all. It's normal. Uh, some, uh, some front ends use pre-built templates or frameworks, some copy off of others, and some are handcrafted. Some are a combination. Personality is UI. It's how users interact. It can trip them up, make them fall in love, or send them running. Uh, with apps, information must travel through the computer systems into the application or from the application to the computer. People also have a computer and an application. Obviously, this is an analogy. Uh, the way we evolve simply pack the complex systems on top of the basic ones, and all signals flow through the... I'm sorry, I lost my place. All systems flow through the, the simple systems out through, into the complex ones. Uh, but, the, uh, but, our I'm sorry. but our computer can be wonky and can interfere with the application. Our computer is our behavior. It's how we can smoke cigarettes even though we know they are not in our best interests. It's also how we can instinctively, I'm sorry, instinctively catch a ball or learn, I'm sorry, where am I here? Uh, it's also how we can safely catch a ball that is thrown at us, uh, that is thrown at us. The computer has learned how to operate in an attempt to serve the application's best interest, but it often finds creative ways of doing so. In fact, for the first 12 years or so, the app is still being developed and the computer is left to fend for itself. Apps can be reprogrammed, redesigned, their specs improved and expanded, and their computer can be recalibrated too. It's all code and code is changeable. No app is bad. They may have failing specs, poor code quality, a confusing API, and a poor front end. Despite all of that, at the end of the day, they are trying to satisfy their user base and provide a business value. A crappy API does not mean it's a crappy app. A person who behaves poorly is no lesser a person, only a person who behaved poorly. Most apps want to be loved, spoken of favorably, and to be able to achieve their goal. For most people, that goal is happiness. It is the end to all of our means. And like any good startup, it's not always clear how to get there. And the second talk, uh, is more of a Rails talk, it's along a similar analogy. A good app is like a good friend. They are warm, they are helpful, they are fun, they are friendly, they are considerate, and they are caring. Thank you. Hi. <coughs> uh, uh, sorry, uh, I'm Ashuri. Uh, I'm far at speaking in English, but let me challenge to speak in English in these lightning talks. Uh, uh, introduction. 
I come from Japan to RailsConf. I've been reading more than 10 hours on a plane. It happened when I was going to write the code, Jam install Hoover. Could not connect to internet. Oh, I was very shocked. But I find Jam Miller command after I arrived at the hotel. Yeah, I'm typed Jam Miller. Ooh, era installed the Ruby James Miller gem for the Miller command. Okay, okay. Gem install Ruby James Miller. Gem Miller. Era. Uh, ooh. What? <laughs> I I Google and I find the issue. Does not work with Ruby 2.0. Ooh, I was very shocked. <laughs> <laughs> but this was easily resolved. Uh, I'm typing play, required Ruby James mirror command, gem command, mirror command dot new dot execute. This command is only the beginning to build mirror server. Uh, build mirror server <laughs> and download the gem mirror root there. Uh, uh, latest specs and uh, Marshall space uh, YAML and uh, quick dear uh, latest index and uh, all gem specs and HTTP stats uh, Apache. That good news. I did the new DM uh, Ruby James Mira command. <laughs> yeah, this command is create default gem Mira RC, fetch all gems, fetch all gem spec, fetch all other files needed to build the server, start the server. Yeah. Uh, Ruby gem Mira command fetch, fetch all gem start. Okay. Jamila command server web start. And gem install rails hyphen r hyphen hyphen source http local host. Yes. I will be able to hack in the sky. Yeah. Bad news. <laughs> uh, it took too long time to fetch. <laughs> no. I will be able to hack in the sky at next rails <laughs> call. <laughs> <laughs> One more thing. Uh, my company, Cookpad, works on Ruby 2.0. And uh, I will hold a 24-hour development contest. Join us. Thank you. Is this thing on? Yes, word. Thank you. Um, yes, my name is Winfred Nadeau. I work for developerauction.com. Um, if you happen to be unhappy with your current position and what you do every day, give me a talk. After, or come see me afterward. Um, I'm also at WNATO on Twitter and WNATO on GitHub as well. So I uh, wrote my second gem ever uh, last weekend and kind of encapsulated some logic that our, our, uh, our app has been using. And um, I really just wanted to talk about it and see if this is a terrible idea or not a bad idea. I mean, any feedback would be great. In fact, this is the kind of thing that I might even be one line and like one additional option in some command in Rails anyway. Um, so the gem is speak louder. Make the font bigger. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> All right. So essentially, we had these. Uh, the, we we're trying to avoid using polymorphic associations, 
And we have these two models. Um, we use STI to specify, to specify multiple types of users. Um, but each one has different sets of attributes. And so we needed to delegate to a separate table for, that, for those kinds of attributes. So um, access essentially delegates, it's more of a composition pattern than delegation, but it delegates all of the fields, uh, the field accessors and setters, and any of the um, other helpers that come along with Active Record to the other model and to the other table as well. Um, so it's just, I mean, one little line, and it, it only works for these belong to associations because it's, I mean, it's composition. The, the guy that you're working with has to exist. Um, so essentially, the strength attribute here is actually stored on the rebel profiles table, but you can access it accordingly. Um, and the active, work, uh, active model dirty helpers work, and querying could possibly work in the same way um, with, by joining through the association. Obviously, this would, this would work as is, but ideally, I would like to be able to automatically join the association as, as well through uh, the Ruby syntax like this, but I have no idea what I'm doing. Uh, in fact, this is my first conference and the first speech I've ever given, so please, wow. please feel free to come talk to me after, the, after this. Um, I would love to be told why this is stupid. Anyway, thank you, that's all. Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? Hola. So, my name is David. I go as Dabit on the internet. And I'm here to talk about conferences. I love conferences. You probably love conferences. That's why you're here. Or at least I hope that's why you're here. But uh, I've known people that don't like conferences. I've been attending RailsConf since 2009. And I've met a lot of people over time. And I've known people that I met once and then never came back to RailsCon. And That's weird. They gave all kinds of excuses. Eh, content is not good enough. Talks are too basic. The food is awful. The joke's on you. The food was awesome this year. <laughs> it was. The internet sucks. Why do you want internet? You're supposed to pay attention. <laughs> like. So I think they're missing the big picture. And I hope that you don't miss the big picture. Come back next year. The conference is about the content, yeah, but it's also about the people. It's about going away of that desk that you sit on day after day at home or office and shake hands, you know? Share your stories. You will be amazed by the number of people that you will run into, and they will have the same problems that you had. Talk about it. Let it all out. Share the pain. Go all like, oh, we're still using 2.3. Uh, we're in Kansas. <laughs> I feel ya, you know? <laughs> if you think the content level is low, then you must be an expert. Give some advice. Help everyone else, you know? There's a lot of things to do at the conference. And the other side is, no matter what your mom told you, alcohol is good <laughs> in proper measure. Alcohol is good because it, if you're a shy person, it will bring words out of your mouth, and it will make you <laughs> talk with people. Go to drink cups, and you will see that. It's an effect. And alcohol will make you dance, and that's very important. If you were not there uh, last night, <laughs> you miss all the fun. Dancing. Dancing is good. Go Gangam. <laughs> also, conferences, uh, whenever you go to a conference, thank the people that make it all happen. Thank the people that um, are responsible for your current job. Go find Ryan Bates and thank him for Railscast, you know. You've used Railscast. You've seen one, at least. I know you have. Don't lie to yourself. You've seen those. Give a hug to Aaron Patterson, because he works a lot so you can make money out of his code. 
don't you? I mean, you're, you? You're doing serious cash with his code because you're all using Apple computers, so must be some serious money. <laughs> and even if, if you don't like, like to talk, go find Dr. Nick. He'll do all the talking. Just, you know, <laughs> get in front of him, and he'll talk. Yeah, that's amazing. The list goes on. You know, there's a lot of people. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Nick. Have fun. You know, do not feel guilty of spending the company's money and having some fun. There's nothing wrong in it. Go out there. Meet the people. It's about both things. Content, yeah, you will learn a lot of things, but also people. Make sure that you're meeting people. Make sure that you're saying, hi, I do this, I do that. Oh, really? Yeah, I'm in Kansas too. 2.3. That's it. Finn, thank you. Hello. Uh, I, I'd just like to preface this with, uh, this is the first talk I've ever given. Uh, I've only been coding for about a year and a half, and I've only been working for like two months, so I'm like total amateur compared to you guys, yeah. So yeah, extra woos are appreciated. Um, so I, as was mentioned, I just finished writing this gem, and it was like 15 minutes ago, and then I decided, okay, you know, fuck it, I'm just gonna do a lightning talk on it. Um, uh, it's called RBSS, so uh, if you're like me and you really don't like SASS or CSS, um, you can now uh, do CSS in Ruby. Um, so anyway, uh, let's, uh, so I got this web page here, and you should come work at Zozi. I work at Zozi, it's the best. Um, um, all right, yeah, so I just, I spun up this application, and let's go over. So I wrote this f file, simple.rbss, it's in my uh, assets folder. And I got, uh, div would be the name of the uh, div, I guess, selector. And so here are the properties that I want to use. And I just use like, like a regular Ruby block. And then I can go back to my uh, code here. And if I just, give me a second. That was kind of creepy. <laughs> yes, good. <laughs> Okay, so I'll include this uh, RBSS uh, helper in my uh, layouts file. And then if I refresh the page, there you go. It works, the CSS gets added. And, and, you know, like you can do other things too, like you can do uh, variable assignment and you can do nesting as well. And um, uh, one of my colleagues asked me, uh, well, what do you do if you don't want to name the selector and you just want to name the class? So I put in this uh, underscore, so that, that takes care of that. So you can do variables and stuff too, right? So uh, now we go less simple. Let me refresh the page, and I don't think it worked. Uh-oh. What did I do? Oh, right, it's got to be an array. Gabe, Gabe, Gabe. Refresh, bam! Oh, baby. <laughs> but now you're thinking, okay, so you're thinking like, uh, well, that's not that great. Like SASS already does that. But then you get over to this, and then you're like, oh man, I could totally write like a CSS class. That would be really cool. So I wrote this class, and honestly, I have no idea if this is useful at all. <laughs> but I just thought, you know, like I, I wanted to get more comfortable with the Rails ties hooks and, and how they work. So uh, this came to me in a dream, and, and uh, I thought it'd be kind of cool if you could write a class for, for doing CSS. And I just thought that this would be, this might be a little bit more organized than having this long line of stuff that you don't really understand. Why not put it into a method uh, called descriptive method that, you know, does something. So uh, I create the new, new class um, and then call the method and it, it's gonna take all of this stuff and, and, and put it in. So if you just give me one sec, uh, oh, baby. I'm gonna get a reputation when I come back next year, everyone's gonna be like, oh man, this guy's a creep. <laughs> okay, so now, now I, I don't even know what rules I assigned. Uh, text to line right, width 500 pixels, way to go. And then, and then you can also like nest methods within methods, right? So get that background properties in there because you know like we want this website to look like it's 1995. <laughs> anyway, yeah, so that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>